uh, welcome back, uh, some of you. And for the rest of you, welcome to the second panel of our conference on technology and society. Uh, and uh, we had a wonderful panel this morning, and we're looking forward to a, a, another wonderful panel this afternoon. Uh, and this panel will uh, feature talks on economic growth, uh, economic stagnation, and other economic and, and work-related uh, topics. Um, and just to remind the audience, um, I'm Jeremy Schultz. Uh, I'm a researcher at the study, the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues, uh, located at UC Berkeley. Um, Professor Martin Sanchez Jankowski is also affiliated with that institute, um, and Professor Lynn Chancer, who's in the audience, is at CUNY uh, and Hunter College. Um, and we have organized uh, all these panels. So uh, this panel will address the possible economic consequences uh, and implications of the technological developments which we talked about in the morning. Um, and we'll tackle such issues as technology-driven uh, driven growth and stagnation, labor market displacement, and the restructuring of production and economic distribution and work uh, due to technological uh, innovations and changes. Um, and so now uh, I would like to hand over the microphone to one of our panelists, uh, Professor Dubal. Great. Well, it's an honor, um, really deep honor to be here. There's some the people here who I deeply admire, some of whom I'm first just getting to meet um, in person in these post-pandemic times, and I'm 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 grateful um, grateful to be to be sitting here. So I am going to start by introducing our panelists. Um, first, I will inter and I'll do it in the order in which we are going. So um, really excited to introduce Professor John Paul McDuffie. He is a professor of management at the Wharton School and director of the Program on Vehicle and Mobility Innovation at the Mac Institute for Innovation Management. His global research on the role of human and social capital in achieving high performance manufacturing and automotive assembly is featured centrally in a number of books. In other research, he examines the impact of human resource systems and work organization on economic performance, collaborative problem solving within and across firms, managing people over distance, and whether new disruptive technologies will change product and organizational architecture. And I think his, his work is particularly interesting um, and important in this, in this particular pandemic moment. Um, Professor McDuffie is a founding board member and current president of the Industry Studies Association, a member of the Automotive Experts Group at the Federal Reserve Bank, and a member of the Expert Network on Mobility and Global Automotive Industry for the World Economic Forum. So um, we'll start with comments from Professor McDuffie. Thank you very much, Vina. It's a pleasure to be here. I am drawing today on both uh, research and uh, teaching. The last couple of years, three years ago, to be precise, I started a new undergraduate elective on work and technology. Uh, it was uh, to start on March 20th, 2020. So it was a born virtual course. And finally, in the third teaching this spring, I was able to meet some students face to face. Uh, very bright Wharton and Penn undergraduates, uh, much more knowledge about new technologies in many cases than me, but um, naive about many aspects of the world. So I had to think about ways to uh, give them perspectives on thinking about uh, work and technology. And so uh, that's kind of woven into this talk. I've uh, put first some things about perspectives on these important topics, and then I build towards some of the research findings uh, as I go. And as I thought about uh, you know, today's, uh, this might be a way I would talk to uh, you know, certain students, but let's say it works for any audience. Um, so you read an article about automation and, and job loss and you wanna know what to ask. And you know, one set of things we might logically uh, ask ourselves as researchers and scholars or just uh, interested lay people would, you know, where does the data come from? What's the sample? How's the sample selected? What are the methods? What's the analysis? What, how well are causal claims supported, et cetera? Maybe who paid for the research? What are the interests involved? Um, but uh, I'm going to give a different take, which again reflects some of these different perspectives. Uh, what category of technology? I'm going to offer a non exhaustive set of things that at least still give some perspective on what you're looking at. 
What are the anticipated direct or first order consequences and how are they evaluated? What about the indirect second or third order effects? Are they considered at all? And if so, in what time frame? What jobs and what skills are being investigated? How is skill measured? What about the tasks within the job and whether those can be automated? Is that considered? Does the scope of the inquiry include the full technical stack? And I'll explain what I mean by that. Does it include role relations, things beyond the job? So role relations, intra and intra organizational network effects. And in the process of explaining this, I will cover uh, these different perspectives all to set up uh, some research findings. The examples are primarily from uh, this context that I study most, which I used to call the global automotive industry. These days, I'm more likely to call it the mobility sector. And uh, as the introduction mentioned, I am a director of a program on vehicle and mobility innovation. Vehicles to mean more than just cars and uh, mobility to include both a broader scope and more services as well as products. Um, I'll give you a scattering of examples as well for, of these other technologies. So let me start with a few words about technological determinism. It's part of where I, I start with my students. I, this is, is partly a, a statement of, of, of my own purpose and, and maybe values and also I think a perspective that's, that's important. So we, we hear a lot about the potential of these technologies to transform the nature and organizational work. I think in this crowd, we don't automatically accept um, those claims. Uh, and I would further say that we should not uh, always think of technology as the noun that acts upon the verb as if technology is somehow independently the actor here. Um, the goals, the beliefs, the actions of managers, engineers, technologists, workers all contribute uh, to shaping outcomes. Uh, of course, the technology does too, as designed. Uh, this is an audience that doesn't need convincing about the high consequence of the outcomes of technological change on work, whether at the individual, the organizational, or the societal level. And I would say that if you frame a question about the impact of technology in a deterministic way, it obscures many important things. It obscures the role of human agency, it obscures the role of managerial choice, it obscures the range of issues at play, and it obscures worker voice. Uh, I will say that in this emphasis of choice, I, I see uh, more of the economists who are commonly quoted on these topics, uh, I don't know if it's coming around to this or at least stating it a little more bluntly. This is around the time, I think, of the economics meetings in January of this year. Economists blame more, pin more blame on tech for rising uh, inequality. So Darren Asimoglu saying, automation-fueled inequality is not an act of God or of nature. It's the result of choices corporations and we as a society have made how to, uh, about how to use technology. Uh, Eric Brynjolfsson, uh, formerly MIT, now Stanford, talks about the Turing test, uh, matching human performance has been the guiding metaphor for technologists, business people, and policymakers to develop AI systems that replace workers rather than enhance their performance. I think that's a mistake. And Paul Romer, economist taught, it's the market, it's, there's nothing we can do. That's really just so wrong. Um, and uh, so, some of you who know these folks better than I might know if this is a change of heart or that they're just simply uh, stating it a bit more bo bo boldly. On this two by two that contrasts deterministic and voluntaristic uh, uh, approaches to thinking about these issues, I'll uh, right away you know, rule out the main uh, diagonal here. Uh, so I've already told you my views about technology determinism. I also think a purely social constructionist view of technology is, is also um, mis misguided or it tends to lead you away from some important issues. So let me talk about the off diagonals as well. And I want to link it to the sort of lens that's often applied by researchers, uh, researchers who take a micro focus and want to understand a specific case of the implementation of technologies, the design and implementation office often are trying to really highlight the moments of critical choices that were made, the human agency, the, the interests, et cetera. And I would say are really uh, at their very best and often with ethnographic field work are trying to show how the social and the physical and material are inextricably entangled in technology in use. And uh, I draw tremendous value from that work, and uh, you'll see signs of that uh, through all of this. 
I mean, I arrived at MIT right after Steve Barley had graduated with uh, his famous dissertation looking at two different implementations of radiology uh, technologies in two Boston hospitals with very different consequences for how those jobs played out, how the relationships between technicians and, and doctors uh, played out, consequences for, for diagnosis and interpretation. And uh, uh, Diane Bailey and Paul Leonardi are both students of Steve's, so this is in that um, tradition. I would say that the more the macro focus is taken and the more a longer time frame is looked at, sort of as the, as the lens zooms out to take in a much bigger scope, uh, I think probably this uh, other cell is uh, probably more relevant. And uh, what I call soft determinism is the fact that while there may have been agency and choice at a moment in the design and implementation process, after some time passes and you get cumulative implementation at scale, you get more and more uh, things built around the technology as designed, the more it has a stronger force to perpetuate that track even though there may still be some options for choice. Uh, and I don't think that's any surprise, but I think uh, it's sometimes you would get from the micro cases, the idea that there would perpetually be choices that could be made. And I think that's at least as you get to a more macro scale, that's probably um, less true. Uh, one example that I like to uh, sort of talk about the, the, the fallacies of technological determinism is uh, the case of CNC machine, machine tools. And you'll see me refer a number of times here to a report that I wrote with uh, two labor economists, uh, Erica Groshen and Sue Helper, uh, about the employment and skill effects of autonomous vehicles. We did this for an organization called Securing America's Future Energy, uh, a think tank in Washington. And uh, we opened that report with a look at history and particularly these cases. And uh, so um, I'm just going to focus on this one for now. And I think for many of us, David Noble's book was really our introduction to this case. Um, two different paths, one of which came to dominate. Uh, so before this technology, machine tools were operated by highly school, skilled machinists. They would decide everything about the sequence of cuts and tools, make the fixtures to hold the parts steady, make the speeds and feeds work for that particular metal. The uh, first path as a further automation of this uh, machining was contemplated came from the US Air Force, which subsidized a lot of the early development of CNC machine tools. And they, they had a fairly explicit goal of eliminating reliance on skilled labor uh, for some national security goals, I think as, as much as anything. Um, uh, so eventually the, the computer controls became more sophisticated by the 1960s. And the way they developed this was with an, a relatively high level programming language that required skilled engineers uh, who had to be uh, taught and, and had to learn that language. It typically was not taught to machinists. So it was seen in sort of a classic separation of conception and execution as the, the language should be uh, the domain of the engineers and the workers should simply um, follow the instructions. There were a lot of problems with this particular implementation, uh, the, both the expense of the capital and the maintenance, but also a lot of errors at first. Uh, but uh, the Air Force stuck with it and eventually they were able to make more complex parts um, than a skilled machinist. So this uh, did persist for some time. But the alternate path of record playback uh, simply took note and observed and recorded in various ways the actions of skilled machinists actually doing the job and then transferred that into a program, which then was played back for the purposes of making the automated tool work. Uh, in a way, it's a similar logic to machine learning. and. It was implemented in some settings. In some other settings, the machinists were taught to actually do the higher level abstract programming. But mostly what you saw in the early part of this history, or, or maybe for most of this time period, was this path one uh, kind of dominating. And machinist skills tended to obsolesce as they weren't actively using them um, anymore. Uh, in, I don't know if this is irony or, 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 or something else, but now the way many cobots are programmed is in fact by somebody, 
you know, an operator moving the arm and writing the program or modifying the program in, in that way. So in a way, the record playback has come back and is now the dominant form, advances in the technology, other changes have perhaps made that more possible, but it certainly suggests there was more than one path, uh, and in fact, the, 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 the scorned path early on comes back to uh, maybe dominate um, in the end. Okay, a little bit about categories of technology. I found this useful with my students, but I think in general that if we start off with capital T technology, we imagine perhaps often the, the larger or more transformative kinds of technology, and we have that. We've seen that historically. We've seen it at present. But there's other things as well that probably don't have as big an impact. So infrastructural technology is, is this is uh, the way uh, Steve Barley has a recent book sort of summarizing his whole career, and I've uh, referenced it a few times here. He uses that term. There's probably others used as well, but sort of the broadest impact, the ripple effects that ripple out from jobs to organizations to societies. Uh, general purpose technologies, I'm not going to say a lot now. I, I took out a section about how uh, the way Moore's law is slowing down and also some of the evolution in chip design means that uh, microprocessors are not any longer such a general purpose technology, which has a bunch of implications, um, but I'm not going to cover that today. The point basically is that microprocessors are becoming far more specialized to certain tasks, so a video chip is very different from, uh, from other kinds of processing chips. A substitutive technology is Certainly a big change, but it may only affect quite locally a set of tasks that were done before with old technology. So it now can be done better and perhaps with some enhancements, but it may not ripple out in the same way. And then there's this intriguing category of so-so brilliantly named um, uh, technology, I think. Um, since I live in Philadelphia, uh, my wife always talked about wanting to open a little pizza spot south of south so she could call it so-so pizza. Um, but we haven't done it yet. <laughs> uh, so anyway, this is um, how Barley uh, sort of shows the infrastructural technology uh, having this movement from affecting occupations and techniques out to organizations and other institutions and then potentially affecting a lot of the broader society. And it occurred to me, um, since I also uh, t uh, tell my students about this, that these are, if you go back to the earliest part of the 20th century, which Paul Krugman did yesterday, these are the, the technologies that uh, Professor Gordon, I think, would give an Oscar to, if I remember his TED talk um, correctly. Uh, so, um, and one of the things I do early in my course after having the students read more deeply about the history of the Luddites is where the idea is to take seriously the resistance that people have to technologies as something you can learn from, is I have them meet in groups to brainstorm a little about what are the current technologies that we fear. And this was the list that they came up with um, uh, just a couple of months ago. Uh, you'll see things that we're covering in this conference, obviously, um, including robots and autonomous vehicles. Um, so, so technologies, again, uh, Darren Asamoglu and uh, Pasquale Restrepo, talking about uh, technological advances that don't actually generate that much of a productivity boost or that much of a quality of service boost. Um, so if you replace workers but have a big productivity gain, that may be painful, but at least it delivers value. But the so-so technologies may not even do that. Um, my favorite example is self-checkout kiosks. I, I don't have data on this, but it seems to me there's just as many people buzzing around needing to help people check out. And what you don't get is the opportunity for a little bit of conversation, communication, banter, maybe some upselling or getting people to buy one more thing or a question answered. Um, so, so anyway, so those are some categories. And I think it's worth thinking about that as you kind of look at the, at the, at the, way to evaluate going forward. Okay, direct and indirect impacts of technology. Zooming along here, and if I go over any of this too fast or just because it's not clear, um, we have lots of question times, so you can uh, bring me back to it. Uh, I think that we have a long history, of course, of technologies uh, being introduced that raise fears about job loss and de-skilling. And I would, on the basis of not exhaustive work, but um, some consensus from uh, the colleagues I worked with, particularly in that earlier report, that there's a fairly clear historical record, which is, or trend, which is that the, the direct impact of the first order effects are pretty relatively easy to, to anticipate, and they show up in the short term. You expect that the automation is gonna cause some job loss, it does, 
usually less than expected because the technology doesn't work or the entire job can't be automated, but nonetheless. Um, what then is much more difficult to imagine or predict are the second order effects. And I think, again, it's, it's hard to have a definitive methodology for this, but the claim would be that the jobs created eventually via the indirect effects are larger in number than the job losses from the direct effects. Often higher in skills as well, because one thing automation does is it automates the most routine, either cognitive or manual tasks, and what it leaves maybe higher in skills. Uh, a big problem, and I'll return to this several times, of course, the people who lose the jobs from direct impact are often not the same people who might gain jobs via the indirect impact, and there's also the time lag as well. Uh, and, and I'll say a little bit more about some of the reasons why um, a sort of anticipated market adjustment would not um, happen. Uh, this is my favorite example of why the indirect effects can really be surprising and um, hard to predict and uh, worth keeping in mind uh, so that we don't have too much confidence about our ability to predict them. So ATMs, I didn't realize they were invented in the 1960s, but it took them a long time to work out the bugs. They didn't work in the cold. They gave out the wrong amounts of money. And so really, the diffusion didn't take off until the 1980s. And you would certainly expect a direct impact on teller jobs from a technology called automated teller machines. And in fact, there was a loss over a decade in the US of 41,000 uh, uh, teller jobs and a broader loss of jobs in commercial banks during this period, possibly also because of other sorts of automation. Now, here's the intriguing puzzle. By the late 90s, you had a growth in both the number of ATMs and the number of teller jobs because banks pivoted to a strategy of opening tons of small branches all through city neighborhoods, at least high density ones. And you may remember, if you live in a city, you may remember when it happened. Suddenly there was a bank branch every couple of blocks. And why? I mean, it was this idea that you were trying to sell more different financial products. You needed to get people to come in to have that stickiness, that relationship. There were, of course, always some customers who wanted to speak to a teller anyway. And those were sometimes the customers who you could perhaps talk in, to, into getting some other financial products from the bank. Um, so those new sales jobs actually sometimes became a career path for tellers, depended on the, the policies of the bank, but it could be possible. You know, now we have another trend. And again, I see it in, in Center City, Philadelphia. Now you've got the small branches closing and some bigger branches, but fewer of them, which is very likely, I don't have data on this, is going to decrease teller jobs again. But I'm intrigued by what I gather is coming, which is an enhancement of the ATM to provide real-time two-way video so that you could engage with somebody in a call center to help you out with the transaction, which they would probably also use to try to sell you some other stuff or get some other information to you. So um, who knows exactly where this will go, but the sort of the job loss up and down and maybe up again and maybe down again um, shows how hard it is to protect these um, these indirect effects. Uh, back to the report with Eric and Sue, uh, we made a point of talking about uh, sort of a standard uh, set of economic assumptions that market adjustments will be relatively frictionless and so job losses one place will uh, be rectified when people move through a fluid labor market to find the new jobs and to challenge that with a friction filled view and we uh, this will be helpful in a couple of the other things I'm going to talk about. Um, if we look at AV adoption, which of course is still mostly prospective, right? It hasn't happened yet. Uh, we can imagine uh, lower productivity, uh, lower transportation prices and higher personal productivity. This could be as, as people don't have to spend their time driving. What do we do uh, with those two outcomes? We, we buy more transportation. Uh, and that leads to uh, more jobs for transportation companies that may lead to new inputs for the AVs themselves as, uh, as hardware and software uh, bearing products. And so that provides jobs at the suppliers. And then when we consume more stuff, that produces jobs somewhere else in the economy uh, as well. Uh, the lost jobs in this, uh, in this kind of frictionless uh, scenario uh, move without cost with some amount of time to new jobs. But of course, we don't believe that for a second. And we would say 
that the frictions include frictions of geography. So assuming that people will automatically move to where new jobs are um, turns out to be, I think, somewhat less and less the case, at least in the US. There's less of that kind of geographic mobility. Um, skills, of course, can be a barrier. Um, investment, I mean, it, it may be that there's not uh, enough investment in the new jobs right away or the technologies that support the new jobs. So that creates a lag effect. Um, uh, worker voice could affirmatively affect this uh, or, or negatively as, as, it, as it plays out. So, um, so anyway, lessons from past transitions. If full employment does eventually return with new jobs, uh, then the worker losses are clearly uncompensated. And those losses are concentrated uh, geographically uh, in terms of sector. They may be quite high. Uh, they precede the benefits. So the benefits of the technology may not have shown up yet at the point that the losses that fall on some workers are felt. Uh, it could fuel a certain amount of uh, resistance to the technological change. And uh, a, a bit of a um, historical generalization uh, based on just one case here, but the new wealth doesn't flow naturally to those who were displaced. And uh, I, think, uh, I think Paul Krugman referred to this a bit last night as well. After the Industrial Revolution, with unprecedented amounts of productivity increase, wages fell for 50 years. And wages only started to grow, not because of a change in the pay policy of the companies with the new technology, but by the rise of unions, child labor laws, um, public education, and extended voting rights. So policy and implementation matter. I'll return to that. It's a big part of tomorrow's agenda as well, obviously. OK. Uh, getting close to the end of my perspectives, and then I'll be able to talk to you about uh, the couple of the research findings. So skill-based technological change has been one of the primary uh, theories brought to bear on explaining uh, inequality in real wages and also the slowing of real wage growth. And uh, of course, the idea is that the technology is better suited to more highly educated workers and not to less educated workers. So it increases the productivity. I think you all know this. Um, and uh, so you get these contrasting effects, more demand, more wages for skilled workers, the opposite for unskilled workers. Um, what I want to show is some of the damage, I think, done by applying this uh, kind of skill-oriented approach to this issue of automation and jobs. And I will signal out one um, study for particularly nasty commentary here. And I haven't, haven't met these gentlemen, so it may not be fair. But um, this one made headlines all over the world because it predicted that 47% of all jobs in the US could be automated now based on existing technology. Um, here, I'm not talking a lot about methodology, but I will here. So they had a workshop with a bunch of uh, scientists and domain experts, and they basically labeled an entire occupation as automatable or not, one zero, and then they used that for the first 70 occupations to do a machine learning training for the entire ONET set of 600 jobs slash occupations. And this is the result they got of the 47%. Um, percent. So imagine that uh, you think about an occupation, you decide if it's entirely automatable, you assign it a category, and then you base um, a big projection on, on that. Um, they qualified their predictions in appropriate language in their publications, but it didn't get picked up that way, I would say. And so um, there's the, uh, the group of uh, occupations with, and you can't really see the details, but they talk about what those, what those are. Well, right away, there were some, I would have to say, much better studies, basically, um, conceptually, uh, including one by McKinsey, which just said, you know, look, there are capabilities, each occupation involves multiple skills or capabilities. So let's see if we can break this down more by which capabilities are automatable. And uh, this was their sort of rank order of capabilities that were more or less automatable. And so they end up with, you can't see this either, but the color coding is to reveal how much automation potential there is for each of the capabilities. And then you see the types of occupations um, in the, down the, down the y-axis um, there. Oh, this is another way of showing the McKinsey findings uh, that only, 
Uh, not very many occupations, they concluded, I would say correctly, are 100% automatable. Um, uh, only 5% in their methodology, but 60% have at least 30% that are automatable. Uh, still, I think, a rather high estimate. Um, facing this criticism, uh, Fry and Osborne redid their study to try to take more of a similar approach, and they reduced their uh, estimate to 20% uh, and acknowledged the need for more fine-grained work. So, uh, which I would hardly endorse. Um, but more broadly, I think a critique of the skill bias approach is that uh, it turned out to actually, for a while, it seemed to explain some of what was going on with inequality, and then it got way off course because the, the issue is not that there is less low wage work, it's that the middle is disappearing. And, uh, and the increase in low wage work is not a good thing. Um, and, and it is often low wage work that doesn't involve any, any automation as, at all. Um, I also don't like the fact that skill, which is an important su supply side variable, is simply inferred from examining jobs. So you look at a job, which is a demand for skill, and you say, OK, if this job needs this skill, then the people in those jobs must have these skills. You lose the chance of understanding how some people may be over or under uh, qualified for jobs. Um, there's some interesting debates about what exactly is skill, um, since humans are unconsciously good at a bunch of things that are still impossibly difficult for robots to do. Um, but uh, one of the things that bugs me most is I feel like this perspective is too deterministic. And so far better, in my view, is what I think has become the norm, which is to take more of a task perspective. To acknowledge that tasks are uh, jobs, are bundles of tasks. Automation affects tasks, not or rarely entire jobs. And tasks are what's outsourced. So if you take a job and you see that three tasks out of seven can be automated and four can't, this leaves some choices for the manager, for the technologist. Do you, audit, do you try to redesign the job so that you take out the fully automatable part and leave the fully unautomatable part? Do you decide it's just too much trouble to do anything about it and you leave it as it is? Do you go for some kind of enhancement of the human capacity to do the job, which might be a different way from how, where you started with the goal of the technology? So it, it highlights choice, it highlights the human technology interface, it highlights the opportunities of the complementaries of humans and computers. Uh, I may have actually said a number of these things already. I think I did. Um, so uh, then on to a perspective about new jobs. So um, David Otter has done a lot of great work in this area, has a recent uh, paper with Solomons and Siegmiller that did a deep dive into the occupational directories going back to the 1940s to look at, at new jobs. So the first three things that they talk about here really echo what I talked about when I showed you that framework for autonomous vehicles. You have a productivity effect that creates some new jobs. You have price reductions that may create more consumption, which helps create some jobs. You get supplier network effects, but they also talk about, uh, uh, frontier work, which would be some kind of innovation in the economy, not necessarily technological, that produces new jobs. Wealth work, which is, as there have been more wealthier and wealthier people, they invent new services that they want that hadn't been imagined before, and that provides some jobs. Last mile jobs in a more delivery-centric world have become uh, increasingly important. And so, um, yeah, so this is just to remind you that the, the, the three of those are basically the sources of the new jobs in the framework I described to you earlier. Uh, what they find is that uh, fully 60% of the work defined as occupational titles uh, performed in 2018 had not yet been invented as of 1940. So, um, and here's some examples of new occupational titles appearing each decade, some in an innovation category and some in a demanded services category. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually quite fascinating to look at, at uh, not just this list, but others that they came up with and realized, yeah, I guess that probably didn't exist before, and, and now we're in a world where, where it does. Okay, and my final uh, uh, brief uh, perspective here, thinking about how to gauge, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a cumulation, uh, cum cumulative uh, uh, perspective of what came before. Uh, another thing grab from Steve Barley, he talks about a myopic, short-sighted, partial perspective, which is either isolationist, because it looks narrowly at a focal technology, but not at the rest of the technical system that supports it, 
or is reductionist because it just takes such a narrow look at how a job is affected or a task that it doesn't look at the impact on role relationships, inter-organizational, intra-organizational relationships. And you'll remember that the truly infrastructural, the, the big bang technologies are the ones that ripple out from jobs to occupations, to organizations, to institutions, to society. So um, to take locomotives as uh, one example, uh, Barley says, well, if you really want to think about the job impact of either the creation of the locomotive uh, industry or the, the, the train sector and particularly demand for locomotives, uh, you would need to look at a sort of hierarchy and he uses a, a, a set of terms really out of the IT world because he's going to apply it to digital technologies um, coming up. Uh, but you know, you need to understand where who's making steam domes and fireboxes and ash pans and what raw materials go into that and what mining jobs go with that. If you really want to under, say you're understanding the possible job uh, impact of the beginning of a sector or of course the decline of a sector. And uh, oh, why did that happen? Those were nicely right side up. Um, he goes on to say, if you're analyzing a digital technology, there's both a physical stack. So, you know, uh, digital technologies are supported by servers, which have chips in them, which uh, draw on these minerals. So you can actually build a similar physical hierarchy, but there's also a digital stack. Sorry about that. And then to the reductionist view, it's, uh, it's a little bit back to the uh, idea that Sure, you want to look at how a job and how work practices are affected, but the really big effects come if you look at relationships uh, and organizational networks. And my favorite example of this comes from work by one of Steve's students, Matt Bean, uh, who did a, a fascinating study of uh, ethnography of surgical robots and urology. So uh, this, I think, justifies the classification of a substitutive technological change because Basically, yes, hard to learn, um, but surgeons do the same sets of tasks with hand and foot controls. They get better outcomes. There are some other enhancements. Uh, there, one enhancement is that you can say, you know, you are a surgical center that has these uh, advanced technology and these better outcomes. No apparent impact on employment numbers or compensation for surgeons. So this was not a labor displacing uh, technology at all, but surgeons do more than surgery. And again, back to you don't want the reductionist view of thinking that's all they do. For, for one thing, they train residents. And this turns out to be where the biggest unexpected impact of these robots have come. Uh, and, and, you know, Matt observed this in several different settings. Um, basically, when a resident would make a mistake during robotic surgery with basically a surgeon sitting right next to them, imagine uh, driver driver training, you know, where the teacher is sitting in the in the other seat. Um, the surgeons would typically kick them off and finish the job themselves. And I had a student whose father was actually a surgeon uh, of urology, and he said, "Well, it's it's complicated because we're worried about liability. It's a bunch of things. It's just easier to take it over and make sure it's done right." Um, whatever. The point is that in the old apprenticeship model, you have a surgeon standing there, leaning over, looking at things, pointing, whispering in your ear, or yelling at you, whatever. But you finished the whole job and you got the training. And so what they're finding is residents are graduating without adequate surgery skills. And it's really some of the people hiring them are saying, wow, uh, <laughs> you know, you can't step in and do this job the way we want you to. Now, that's not the static uh, outcome here because there were some entrepreneurial residents who realized this was coming or heard about it. They would try to get placements at a hospital with a robot that wasn't being used, do lots of training on their own, unsupervised, but to get good at the robot. And Matt calls that shadow learning. Later on, they're a scarce group that are really good at the robotics and they are much in demand and they have uh, much higher wages. So you get even a two tier kind of wage structure for the, for the surgeons. Okay. Uh, Autonomous vehicles looking at trucks and then electric vehicles looking at both manufacturing and maintenance. And uh, these are not so long actually. So uh, I'm sure I've used up my time, but I'll, I'll do this quickly. Uh, okay, so in this report with Sue and Erica, we tried to look broadly at uh, a bunch of different scenarios. We tried to take in mind some of the lessons I've talked to you about. Um, I won't take you into this link, 
but there's a wonderful uh, graphic visualization, data visualization on NPR that shows uh, for every year between, I think, 1990 and 2020, the dominant occupation in a state. And year by year, trucking starts to pop up in almost every state in the country. Um, why, you know, it's a, it's, it's a job that's needed everywhere. Anyway, it doesn't matter as much, but it certainly caught everybody's attention when the idea of autonomous trucking came along. Oh my God, hundreds of thousands of people are gonna be put out of work. So uh, we uh, took advantage of Erica's expertise, former commissioner of the Bureau of Labor Statistics. We drew on a lot of different sources of data. Uh, we had some scenarios for the adoption of the technology itself that came from SAFE. And I'm just going to show you for trucking, we had basically a slow and a fast um, scenario. For cars, we had both a privately owned and a fleet uh, scenario. The, the, I think the methodological details are not important here. Uh, but we did try to apply more of a task lens. So we would look at an ambulance driver versus a school bus driver versus a public bus driver and think, what are the tasks that they do? How many of those are automatable? What do we think that would mean about the percentage of those jobs that could be automated? And that filled in the table here with some different percentages that would be affected. They're my, my co-authors. Um, uh, we made no, look at the down at the bottom here, we made no effort to assess the number of new jobs created. And you could say it's a cop-out, but it's what often you do because those second and third order consequences are hard, particularly here. There's no actual implementation, really of the technology yet. There's no way to estimate the combination of, let's say, electric and autonomous or other kinds of, uh, of things that would affect the sources of jobs. What will this higher productivity be? What will that mean for new consumption? So this was entirely looking at the loss side of the scenario. <laughs> we did come up with a number because uh, that's part of what we were asked to do. So, uh, but a range because the scenarios were, you know, as you see, slow and fast for trucking, fleet or personal for cars. 1.3 to 2.3 million workers displaced. But we also looked at the timing of that, and it really hits hold in 20, the 2040s, essentially, according to this uh, calculation, with a uh, 0.06 or to a 0.13 uh, percentage point difference in the unemployment rate. Uh, this is roughly comparable to the number of jobs that were outsourced to China in the 90s. It's a small increment up in unemployment, a small increment down in labor force participation. The losses per worker are potentially very high. And again, remember, the, uh, those people won't necessarily immediately get the new jobs, but it does happen quite slowly. There's a lot of time for adjustment. So that's a, a point that we hammered home. However, what you all know is that this level four automation has really not happened yet and looks to be much harder than we thought. The technologies and autonomy that are really taking off are driver assist technologies which make driving much safer. It does, however, mean that the methodology of estimating job loss is really screwed up, right? Because if you don't have drivers eliminated, you have drivers with some enhanced ability to do their job more safely, maybe taking on some other tasks, um, then that's important. So it also focuses some attention on if it's not eliminating jobs, what are the impacts and what are the policy choices Here's Steve Vaselli, who I think is known to many of you, um, real expert on the trucking sector, uh, talks, I think, very powerfully in his Berkeley report about um, technological determinism. Uh, Americans talk about automation, asking how many jobs are at risk, how many jobs will there be, who will do them. These are the wrong questions. They suggest a policy discussion that starts at the end, focusing on mitigating the negative impacts, and that that makes it look like a deterministic process. Uh, how a technology develops and the jobs that are destroyed or created are very much up to the public to decide. It's public policy that will determine the type of self-driving trucks. And I'll, I'll refer you to Steve's report, but he talks about one scenario which perpetuates a trajectory of driving jobs these days for particularly long distance being basically bad jobs with incredibly high turnover and uh, provides an alternative uh, scenario which involves some autonomous truck ports outside of cities where autonomous trucks could unload because uh, that's the easiest uh, thing, a, a kind of geofenced using long distances on the interstate, uh, could transfer to uh, delivery vans 
that would be uh, run by drivers or possibly would involve um, some expert drivers as remote operators of a platoon. Um, so anyway, the point here is that uh, this is absolutely a task perspective kind of, kind of situation where uh, the ta you have to look at all the tasks that a truck driver does. Uh, electric vehicles, uh, here's a article, yeah, okay, uh, for, from Germany predicting 100,000 jobs, but not looking at a lot of things that I said need to be looked at. They do call attention to the need to look at reskilling. Um, there's a lot of questions about uh, EV manufacturing. I just want to say that a current study with a couple of French colleagues we find at the moment, almost all EV manufacturing is happening in existing plants because there's a lot of process commonality. If you look there at the row that begins with 400 volt harness, um, you have stations where either an electric or an internal combustion uh, technology is, is installed. Uh, 74 out of 76 of the, of the models that we looked at, so almost 100%. And one motivation is preserving jobs actually for these companies. Um, maintenance jobs, uh, you know, a lot less maintenance is needed, but some studies that suggest that the repairs take longer and you need higher skills for that. Um, and so it's kind of reductionist to look only narrowly at oil changes when there's a lot of other jobs that may be created as you uh, have EVs diffuse, including things related to charging. Um, so, uh, okay, so uh, I'm over time. So let me just say, what I hope you'll take from this is some uh, my argument about rejecting technological determinism, remembering categories of technology, remembering that the first order effects direct are easy to anticipate, but the second order ones are not. The frictions need policy remedies. The task perspective is a big advantage over the skill uh, perspective. Uh, lots of new jobs being created and avoid the isolationist and reductionist ways of thinking about technology and uh, the impact on jobs. Thank you. <laughs> um, many of you likely know, and he needs no introduction, but I will um, introduce him nonetheless. Professor Robert Gordon is the Stanley G. Harris Professor in the Social Sciences and Professor of Economics at Northwestern University. He is one of the world's leading experts on inflation, unemployment, and long-term economic growth. His recent work asking whether U.S. economic growth is almost over has been widely cited, and in 2016, he was named as one of Bloomberg's top 50 most influential people in the world. He is a distinguished fellow of the American Economic Association and a fellow of both the Econometric Society and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He is a research associate of the National Bureau of Economic Research and a member of the Enver Music, uh, Business Cycle Dating Committee. He is also a research fellow at the Center for Economic Policy Research in London and an economic advisor to the Bureau of Economic Analysis and a member of the Policy Advisory Panel of the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago. And he can't be with us today because I think his, his, um, his wife fell, um, but we're excited to have you here in this hybrid format. Thank you for that nice introduction. Okay, so how do we reconcile ongoing innovation that we just heard a lot about with the evidence that American economic growth is stagnating. <clears throat> the media are awash with stories of technological revolutions propelled by ubiquitous robots and emerging artificial intelligence. Yet the decade just passed witnessed the slowest productivity growth in US history. Yes, growth has revived in the two pandemic years, 2020 to 2021. Is this a sign that the, the slowdown is over? We'll get to that toward the end. Did robots and artificial intelligence cause the revival? I'm going to start by taking a century-long view of productivity growth since 1890. I'm going to show you how there were 50 golden years of unusually fast productivity growth, and I'm going to attribute that to the great inventions that happened at the end of the 19th century. There was a partial revival in the 1990s and 2000s, why did that happen? And why was it then followed by the stagnant decade of 2010 to 2019? What happened to all those robots and all that artificial intelligence? And we'll conclude 
by interpreting the pandemic economy that has just been finished. Now here is productivity growth, the growth in output per hour per year in each decade since 1890. You'll notice that five decades are colored in green. Those are the fast growing decades, all in a row, 1920 to 1930, 1930 to 1940. The, the fastest growth of all was the decade of World War II, 1940 to 1950, and so on up to 1970. Before 1920, growth shown in blue was slower. After 1970, growth was slower as well, although it seemed to be picking up after 1990 into 2000. And then we have that signature red decorating the growth in 2010 to 2019, the growth of productivity well under 1%. So what happened? The slowing productivity growth reflects a smaller impact of innovation, especially when we think back to the golden age of 1920 to 1970. <clears throat> Skip back to the first industrial revolution between 1770 and 1840. It had a continued impact through the end of the 19th century. We had the steam engine making possible railroads and steamships. We had cotton spinning and weaving, getting rid of manual labor and bringing out the Luddites. We had the transition from wood to steel, so evident in the naval warfare of 1914 versus 1805. But the first industrial revolution was nothing compared to the second. And the timing here starts around 1875 uh, and goes on into the 1910s and 1920s. A number one, we had the invention of electricity. Electric light, power, elevators, streetcars, subways, fixed and portable electric machines, kitchen appliances, and finally air conditioning coming in uh, in large buildings and movie theaters uh, before World War II. We had the internal combustion engine making possible cars and trucks that replaced horses, making possible personal travel and all of its uh, accoutrements like motels and rural restaurants. We had commercial air transport made possible by that same internal combustion engine. Then we had information, communication, and entertainment. Newspapers, telephone, phonograph, radio, motion pictures, and finally TV invented before World War II, but not implemented until after the war. <clears throat> the category of chemical includes plastics, antibiotics, and the tools of modern medicine. Don't forget running water and sewers, also brought to most of urban America between 1870 and 1930, making possible female liberation. Did you know that in 1885, the typical North Carolina housewife uh, walked 180 miles a year carrying 45 tons of water? All that water had to be brought into the house for every purpose. And running water and sewers also made possible uh, the elimination of many infectious diseases and the conquest of infant mortality. And the change in working conditions is number six on this list. Jobs were hot, dirty, and dangerous uh, in agriculture and manufacturing back in the late 19th century. And there was a transition uh, over the years to air-conditioned offices. Think of all these transitions that could happen only once. We went from a mainly rural society to a mainly urban one. Light went from polluting flames to instant on-off switches. Power went from steam engines attached to their final movement by rubber belts to fixed and portable electric motors. Speed went from the speed of the hoof of a horse or the sail of a sailing ship to the Boeing 707 in barely a century. The inside temperature went from alternating cold in winter and hot in summer to central heating and air conditioning, keeping a uniform temperature. We got instantaneous communication. We got bathrooms, running water, waste disposal, and life expectancy in the first half of the 20th century grew at twice the rate of the last half of the 20th century. That wasn't the last industrial revolution. We had the third industrial revolution, 
uh, sometimes called EICT, standing for Entertainment Information Communications Technology. Entertainment, of course, we've observed the evolution of TV from those tiny 10 inch black and white screens to color, to time shifting and streaming. We've uh, watched as information technology has transformed uh, from mainframes to personal computers, the World Wide Web, search engines, and e-commerce. Communications has brought us mobile and smartphones. And we've had what we call uh, productivity enhancers. The ATMs that you heard about uh, previously, barcode scanning and fast credit card authorization uh, that makes getting cash and checking out from a store uh, easier, uh, much easier and faster than it used to be. What happened to make productivity grow so rapid before 1970? The second industrial revolution, as we've seen, consisted of at least six dimensions of great, six dimensions of great inventions. In contrast, the third industrial revolution has been limited to one dimension. The second altered every aspect of life for households and business. And the third has mainly mattered for business as business firms have trans uh, form themselves from typewriters and filing cabinets to flat screens and web access. If anyone has doubts about the importance of the second industrial revolution, ask the Texans who a year ago in February 2021 lost their access to electric power and to running water in some cases for several days. Now about the stagnation and productivity growth that we've seen in that red bar for 2010 to 2019. One idea is that the big inventions had already happened. Offices are using desktop and laptop computers much as they did back around 2000 to 2005. There's been stasis in bricks and mortar retailing. Shelves are still restocked by humans. Deli meat is sliced at the deli counter. Barcode checkout is the same as it was 20, 30 years ago. In e-commerce, in all those Amazon warehouses, humans are still doing the packing and delivering boxes in Amazon branded trucks. In finance, we had the ATM machine way back in the 1980s and Wall Street began trading stocks with billions of shares every day uh, more than 20 years ago. In medicine, electronic medical records are here, but there's little change in what nurses and doctors actually do. And in my industry of higher education, uh, we have given the world rampant cost inflation. Now, the fourth industrial revolution, it is claimed, is now upon us as robots and AI replace human workers. Eric Brynjolfsson has already been quoted. Uh, he and his co-author, uh, McAfee, wrote back 10 years ago uh, in The Atlantic, because the exponential digital and recombinant powers of the second machine age have made it possible for humanity to create two of the most important one-time events in our history, the emergence of real useful artificial intelligence and the confliction and the connection of most of the people on the planet by a common digital network. Either of these advances alone would fundamentally change our growth prospects. When combined, they have, they, uh, they're more important than anything since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, and Brynjolfsson, in testimony in 2019, said, I think that with the right policies, the next decade will be the most fruitful in history. The most fruitful, best decade in U.S. history? Well, that's quite a mountain to climb. Look at 1940 to 1950 with 4% annual growth compare it to the most recent decade, 2010 to 2020, with 0.9%. Now, what about these robots and the puzzle of missing productivity growth over the previous decade? There are two aspects of Brynjolfsson's fourth industrial revolution, robots and AI. <laughs> now, robots have been used in manufacturing and have been around in a long, for a long time. And we're going to look at the specific productivity behavior of manufacturing in 2010 to 2019. So far, we've just looked at the total economy. We're gonna look at the advantages and limitations of robots and of AI, and we're going to uh, finish 
those special features of productivity growth that have occurred during the two last pandemic years. Now here's the census of installed robots. Japan was way ahead uh, with a smaller economy. It had far more robots 30 years ago. Japan has stagnated in the number of installed robots, whereas the US has fully caught up, going from 50,000 to 300,000 by 2018, the latest data that I have. The growth of robots looks impressive, but as of 2019, the number of installed robots was only one robot per million hours of work. Germany and Japan have three robots per million hours of work, but that's just a very few robots to replace a lot of human work. Of all the installed robots in the United States, fully three quarters are located in just two sub-industries inside of manufacturing, with almost none in the rest of the economy. Uh, those two industries are motor vehicle manufacturing and the manufacturing of electronic and electric equipment. And those two industries together make up about 3% of the economy. So almost all the robots are working in 3% of the economy. Now here's the total US economy, productivity growth, looking at 2010 to 2019, compared to the previous 25 years. And you see there was a big slowdown. And the bar at the bottom shows you the amount of the slowdown was a full percent and a half, 1.6%. Now we're gonna look back at this graph once again and insert in those empty spaces, the performance in 2020 to 2021. If we compare goods versus services, whereas goods makes up 30% of the economy and uh, at least two thirds of that is manufacturing. The rest are utilities, agriculture, mining, and construction. Look there at the second group of bars. Look at that little tiny gold bar. That says that in goods production in the decade of the teens, productivity growth was only 0.2%. We had almost total stagnation in the production of goods. And that was a slowdown shown by the gold bar at the bottom of minus 2.3% from the previous 25 or so years. So what's going on? What's wrong with these robots? Well, we've seen one reason is they're not in much of the economy. They're programmable. They work without a human operator, but with moving parts. They're old news, first introduced by General Motors in 1961. By 1990, 95, robots had taken over some of the most dangerous and tedious tasks in the auto factories, welding and painting. Robot responses, unlike humans though, are limited to what's in the program. And robot responses are limited compared to humans. Think about a human picking up a paper cup of water. It knows just exactly how to hold it with the right pressure so that the water doesn't, isn't squeezed out or it doesn't drop it. We don't drop the cup of water, but a robot has to be programmed to avoid that. Here are these welding robots in an auto factory. This picture could have been taken uh, 20 years ago, except for the styling of the automobiles. Uh, this is old hat. Amazon is at the technological frontier, but in Amazon warehouses, where there are additional robots outside of manufacturing, the robots only move the shelves around to the humans. The humans still pick the objects off the shelves and pack them. Across, around the other side of the world, a team in Singapore taught a robot to assemble an Ikea chair. Much time was taken to program the robot and store the images it needed. The robot took 20 minutes after it was fully trained. The human, uninitiated, took five. Outside of factories, robots are bad at anything that requires a human hand. And our detailed recent study of 30 different countries showed that in the United States, robots had contributed only 0.1% per year to US productivity growth over the last 30 years. Here's another way of seeing how unimportant robots are. Uh, total equipment investment in the US economy in 2018 was $1 trillion or roughly 1,000 billion. 10% of that would be 100 billion, 1% of that would be 10 billion. And the total investment in robots was only 6 billion. So total investment in robots is less than 1% of all the equipment that's being installed. So it's a strange question to ask how much robots are reducing employment. 
Why not? Why distinguish robots from other kinds of equipment capital? In fact, why distinguish robots from job losses, from outsourcing, sending factories to other countries? Here's another way to put all this in perspective. Total U.S. employment from 1979 until the beginning of the pandemic grew at 62 million jobs. Manufacturing employment over the same period dropped by 7 million. According to the study that's already been cited today by Darren Asamoglu and Pasquale Restrepo, the installation of one robot cost three worker jobs, including both the negative direct effects and the positive indirect effects. Well, if you take that, uh, multiply it by all those robots in 2018, we can see the total stock of robots is accounted for a loss of 900,000 jobs. That's only 14% of all the manufacturing jobs that have been lost over the last 40 years. And it's only one and a half percent of all the total jobs that have been gained. We're still here waiting for robots in the service sector. And remember, the service sector makes up 70% of our economy. Now on to our artificial intelligence. Many uses of AI are nothing new. We have search engines, we have facial recognition, voice recognition that use AI for pattern recognition, legal searches causing unemployment on young legal associates, and uh, consumer credit ratings are now largely automated. We know about Amazon. Uh, book recommendations as in recognition through Alexa and the similar smart, smart speakers. We know about facial recognition that many people need to turn on their iPhones. Artificial intelligence is wonderful. Uber matches customer locations with available nearby drivers, plotting optimal routes, applying surge pricing to keep supply equal to demand in busy times. Airline reservation systems used to just change prices seasonally. Now hyperdynamic pricing changes prices as, as much as several times a day, responding to local news and local events. Will AI replace human authors? Well, we've got software writing software. Uh, given how complex software writing is, it's a good, very good thing that AI has come along to help to write software. We have programs teaching computers to write by analyzing millions of pages of text. A program has been developed that can write a mystery story in the style of Harry Potter, but correct grammar doesn't guarantee correct meaning. Uh, this uh, quote is off my screen. Uh, but it says something like, uh, it takes uh, two hops and a jump to move from Hawaii to Route 17. How does AI work? It's based on deep learning. It's caused deep because it uses multiple layers in a neural network between the input layer, say cat images, and the output layer, quote, this is a white cat. And uh, Basically, over the years, the development of exponentially faster computers has allowed many, many more layers uh, to be developed. So these layers are now uh, very deep. But what we get out is ID of recognition that this is a pizza. We don't find out from this program what the pizza is for. There are many limitations of AI. Flexibility in dynamic environments is a key human attribute. We're going to see uh, how that works with autonomous vehicles that we've already heard something about. The inability to adapt to entirely new situations is an enormous challenge for AI. AI typically performs only a limited set of tasks rather than the full set of tasks that define a typical human occupation. There's never enough data, there's bias, and uh, the options must be defined like in the game of Go instead of the unlimited, undefined options that a human is used to dealing with. Is AI a general purpose technology? Well, in its favor, 
there's been an enormous increase in the availability in the ability to deal with new data. But it's less of a general purpose technology than in computers, because with a computer, you can do many tasks. But each AI application has to be programmed separately uh, by skilled engineers. And of course, some of the new jobs that are being created um, in the modern economy are the developers of the robots and AI. But building AI applications is more costly than building computers because humans still have to do it. Now, uh, let's turn to autonomous vehicles, a favorite whipping board boy that we uh, have already heard about. Uh, Elon Musk proclaimed in 2015 that a Tesla would be fully autonomous by 2017. But by 2019, we had a Tesla autonomous vehicle crashing into a truck, killing the driver. And we're still waiting, uh, now 2022, for fully autonomous cars. Autonomous vehicles are now limited to very controlled environments. AV is based on pattern recognition. And the weakness, like all AI, is the inability to deal with edge cases. An escaped horse running down the road. Snow covering up lane markers sticking on a sticker on a stop sign that made the autonomous vehicle think it saw a sign giving it the right to go at 45 miles an hour. And here is a congressional hearing with exactly that example of three black stickers on a stop sign made the AV think it was given the right to go at 45 miles an hour. One research team reported that they're able to fool a Tesla Model S into switching lanes so that it drives directly into oncoming traffic. And to do that, they just had to place three stickers on the road, forming the appearance of a line. AVs are just following examples. And it's harder than pattern recognition because the AV must predict where each identified object will move next. All those objects are not standing still, they're moving. Again, Unimportance based on total equipment spending of $1 trillion for the entire world. Uh, the $1 trillion is just for the U.S. For the whole world, it must be $4 trillion. And total worldwide expenditures on AI in 2018 were $35 billion, just 1% of the total spending on equipment. Of this, about one quarter is for autonomous vehicles. And someone concluded uh, the way I would like to leave it with you about autonomous vehicles. The first 90% of uh, was easy, but the last 10% is 10,000 times as harder, but as, as difficult. Will AI lead to mass unemployment? Well, I conclude just as we've heard already about uh, the future of work. Uh, listen to MIT in 2019. We anticipate that due to slowing labor force growth rates, rising ratios of retirees to workers, and increasingly restrictive immigration policies, over the next two decades, industrialized countries will be grappling with, a, with more of a problem of a shortage of able-bodied adult workers than any kind of surplus of those workers. Now, we've already heard about ATMs and bank tellers. Here's another example of the effects of automation. Uh, Think of a personal computer. Back in 1983, a spreadsheet called Lotus 123 was developed. In 1987, a better one called Microsoft Excel for Windows was developed. And look at the heavy purple line showing that the employment of bookkeepers, accounting, and auditing clerks down here fell from 2 million to 1 million in that job classification. But over the same time, the number of people in the category of management analysis and financial managers grew from 500,000 to 2 million. So here's a great example of the difference between the direct effects of automation, robots or AI, and the secondary creation of new jobs that were not possible without the invention itself. Now back to uh, our historical view of productivity growth. This one you've already seen, highlighting the 0.7% uh, annual productivity growth in the decade of the teens in the total economy. And here for the total economy is what happened in the last two years. Looks like a buoyant revival. And this is the percentage change, the increase 
in productivity growth from the decade of the teens up to the last two years, a speed up or revival of 1.4%. And we've seen before that manufacturing, the major part of goods production, uh, grew at only 0.2% uh, in the decade of the teens. Now it's gone back to 1.3%, not nearly as good as it did before. Uh, the services uh, did much better in the last two years than manufacturing. And we're gonna ask about a particular type of services, uh, that is work at home services. You've heard a lot about work at home. Uh, it became ubiquitous in 2020. People are only straggling back to offices gradually. I've divided up the services into six occupations that are primarily work at home over the last few years and six other occupations that we could call contact services where the person at the job has to be in personal contact with the, uh, uh, with the customer. Retail trade, transportation, accommodation, food services, and uh, hospitality services. So here's the uh, story. Think about forces pushing productivity growth up in a recession. If we have a matrix that the supply curve will shift left along a downward sloping demand curve, and the reduced jobs will be those with the lowest productivity, measured productivity goes up. But in addition, we've had such labor shortages in 2021, the most recent year, that productivity is mismeasured. It's not only going up in truth, but it's going up faster than in truth by mismeasuring it. We have longer waiting times, empty shelves, diminished consumer satisfaction. So measured productivity exaggerated because output is not of the same quality that it was. An example called shrinkflation uh, applies to the hotel industry where housekeepers are no longer visiting hotel rooms every day. Why do we have all these labor shortages in what started out as a recession with massive loss of jobs? Well, we have all heard about the drop in female labor force participation due to at-home schooling and the shortage of childcare. We've heard about a fear of COVID exposure in contact jobs. We've heard about $5 trillion of fiscal transfers and a low interest rate regime, which has caused an unprecedented fast recovery of demand. Workers are now so much in demand that they're asking whether uh, they can to long any longer tolerate tedious low paid jobs uh, with commuting and on-the-job aggravation. There's been a sharp decline in legal immigration. That was in that MIT quote uh, I read to you earlier, and that curtails growth in labor supply. If we need any change in social policy right now, it's a massive increase in legal immigration based on skills and job capabilities and language capabilities. Unfilled job openings have risen steadily there's almost two available jobs for unemployed workers. So workers can pick and choose and they're quitting at a record rate. Here is the history of unemployment. There are more possible explanations for why productivity has revived. We have poor measurement of at-home hours. People are working longer. There, these same surveys show that they're working during time they used to be commuting, but the Bureau of Labor Statistics has not measured this extra work. It's still treating hours per job as the same as it was before. On the other hand, while some of this boom in people go back to work, uh, we may have a permanent increase in productivity growth coming from robust investment stimulated by the labor shortage. Um, and we have a much more healthy financial environment for uh, robust investment uh, because credit lending criteria are much easier than they were back in the financial crisis. And we've had, at least up until very recently, very low interest rates to finance investment. So here are my conclusions. Productivity growth revived in 2020 and 2021. Is this a one-time jump or a permanent increase in the growth rate? Part of it's due to more hours by at-home workers. Uh, a one-time jump that will be partially reversed 
as workers return to their offices. There's been an artificial decline in worker hours <clears throat> because of people staying home, because of COVID, uh, schools being shut down, mothers being forced to be at home with their children. Uh, COVID-related fears will gradually ease and workers will bring come back at least partially reducing some of the labor shortages. A permanent increase in productivity growth uh, due to robust investment could occur, but my interpretation is that overall taking everything together, what we've seen in the last two years is a one-time jump in the level of productivity that will not be followed by a further increase in the growth rate over what we've observed over the last decade. Thank you for your attention. And I did it in 30 minutes. Thank you, Bob, and I, um, I hope that you can continue to listen um, as we move on to the next panelist, and, um, and then uh, it'll be interesting to see how we sort of engage in conversations with one another. Um, you're very present for us, in fact, larger than life, um, one might say, and, um, and we're excited to hear more from you. So um, next, our next panelist is um, um, Professor Michael Pure. Um, Michael is the David W. Uh, Skinner Professor of Political Economy Emeritus at MIT. Um, his current research is centered on work regulation, which is reflected in his recent book on the on root cause regulation, protecting work and workers in the 21st century. He is also working on the impact of innovation policy on the structure of employment opportunities. And in particular, he is looking at the potential of policies modeled on Silicon Valley to undermine employment and legacy industries. Um, Professor Pure has received a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship and two honorary doctorates. Um, he has a Lifetime Achievement Award from the Labor and Employment Relations Association. And I think um, one way to think about the, the hallmark of his work is to think about it through concern for the way in which the economy is em embedded in society and how its evolution is molded and directed um, by social processes. And um, he certainly influenced my, my thought and I know the thought of many people in here. So eager to hear more from you. Well, thanks. Thanks very much. Um, I, I didn't quite figure out how to build this into the talk, but I wanted to say that Bob um, and I were in, we're the, in same the same junior tutorial at Harvard uh, probably 50 years ago. <laughs> and I don't think that we have been on the same panel uh, in, uh, since. Uh, but for every week, we were on the same <laughs> five-person tutorial in Barbara Bergman's uh, junior class. Um, so um, I, I want to uh, talk today uh, about the relationship between social policy and, um, uh, and innovation policy, uh, and I, um, which is a little different than the focus um, of uh, the other speakers on the uh, podium, uh, although uh, I think I join in the end, uh, particularly uh, John Paul's concerns about how to think about um, the impact of jobs on em em employment. But let me say, just by way of introduction, uh, that when I talk about um, innovation policy or technological policy, uh, I'm thinking primarily of the vast uh, ways in which the federal government through the National Science Foundation, through DARPA, through all the military uh, services, each um, military service has its own uh, 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 research uh, uh, branch. Uh, and, uh, and so the federal government is very involved in technology, uh, has an enormous uh, repertoire of technology. Uh, building uh, building programs. I don't think I need to say what social policy amounts to uh, by way of introduction, but I would say that I think in, in term, for me personally, uh, the most important element of social policy is employment policy. And in that area, I think one can argue that the um, uh, in technology policy or innovation policy, if you like, 
and employment policy have really been operating on two separate and uh, 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 and two two separate channels uh, with very little communication uh, uh, among them, and that innovation policy has primarily pushed towards uh, reducing uh, that is uh, kind of employment reducing jobs, and social policy has been primarily. Uh, uh, concern uh, with the de uh, dealing with the uh, displacement effects of these new uh, technologies. Now, I guess I claim the uh, right, if not the responsibility, to talk in this area, and that my own research has been in both of these areas uh, over 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 the years. Uh, but I have seldom thought about, in fact, I don't think I ever thought about uh, the interconnection between them, uh, hard as that may be to rationalize in ret retrospect, until an um, ex uh, erstwhile student of mine, Amos uh, Zahavi, began a, uh, a, a research project in which he interviewed uh, uh, politicians and political um, uh, analysts about what they thought the relationship would between social policy and technology policy was, and nobody thought people were just startled by the question. Uh, it had never occurred to them as something uh, to think about. So uh, I um, am not alone in terms of failing to see this this interrelationship and. Uh, after talking to um, uh, Amos, uh, I spent a good deal of time agonizing over uh, how I could have uh, 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 ignored this relationship. But uh, after considerable thought, I guess, I think that the idea that there should be a tight relationship uh, between social and uh, policy and, and certainly in work is, is uh, uh, a... Uh, uh, I'm sorry, between technology policy and work is, 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 is wrong. Uh, and it's wrong um, in the sense that it, it implies a kind of technological determinism uh, that somehow uh, technology, that is, technology has, is, has a meaning in and of itself and that what you're doing is diverting uh, slightly in one way or another through social policy uh, or, or through uh, you. Um, and I, I don't think, at least in my own work and my own research, that that's the way that technology uh, operates. Technology, uh, as opposed to research, you know, the research and the Science Foundation or even in DARPA takes place at, at the evolution of uh, kind of, um, of, of what we think of as technology uh, takes place at one remove from its application. But technology itself, and particularly its impact in the workplace, really emerges in practice. And it, emerge, and it, and it emerges through the interaction of people, of, of workers uh, with each other and with the um, uh, problems which they're trying to solve. And it does, it's not something which exists separate from the, this ongoing process. And it evolves very much through a step-by-step -step, uh, uh, attempt to deal with particular and immediate, uh, immediate uh, situations. So in a sense, technology exists as praxis, as practice or practice to use an elegant, an, an elegant term, and it evolves through practice uh, and it's not something that is uh, worked out uh, in um, some abstract management uh, meeting where they try and weigh the, uh, the, the impact of technology on the social obligation of the firm and, and so on. So what technology turns out to mean uh, depends very, is very sit situational. It depends a lot on on, on who talks to whom and on, under what circumstances and, and, and when. Uh, and um, now I, I, I thought a lot about how, how, 
how I could make this point uh, in in a talk of this kind, and in some uh, in some ways, uh, John Paul did what uh, I thought couldn't be done, and that is to find examples of work. It's certainly, the uh, Steve Barley it, uh, is the master of ethnographic studies of work and shows how work is is practices. Uh, but other, uh, other, the trouble with uh, um, making this point in this context is that these ethnographic studies are all books. Uh, nobody uh, can re uh, reduces them uh, to a, a, a short a sign, uh, a sound, um, sound bite. Uh, but for me, uh, the point also emerges in consumer te technology. And uh, for me, the, the best example of this is the cellular telephone, which was the subject of one of the case studies that we did uh, at MIT in, um, in, and ultimately appeared in a book called Innovation, The Missing Dimension. Uh, but the, the, but uh, among the products which we looked at was the development of the cellular phone. And the cellular phone, as you probably are, don't remember, or maybe you didn't even know, started out as a car mounted telephone uh, where the technology really was drawn from walkie, uh, walkie talkie. And the idea was it was going to sit in the, what th that is in those days, people talked about the car as the new living room. And you were designing the car as a place where, which was going to be like a living room. And in the middle of the living room was a great big uh, contraption which was the cellular phone. And, 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 and the cellular phone evolved from that uh, initial vision and, and thing. It evolved to the handheld phone that all of, you, uh, all of you have. But the way it evolved was step by step. It evolved by the engineers looking at the way in which people were using it and trying to use it and pushing it just a little bit in a new direction. So there was a point in which the, the, um, the cellular phone, which started out as this big car mounted thing that moved in a car, was being used by uh, women at dinner parties to keep in touch with the, uh, with the babysitter, uh, or it was being used in construction where of all the places in the uh, economy, uh, the workers moved around uh, and, they, and, 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 and went from place to place to place. And the engineers uh, could describe, in Mits I should, what I should say is in Mitsubishi, uh, outside the factory, there is a, a, a display of every generation of cellular phones. And, and how it moves from being this uh, clunky operation to being a, 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 tiny, a relatively tiny thing uh, with a detour, I must add, in the shell phone uh, that was even small, uh, smaller, but that couldn't accommodate some of the things that eventually became incorporated in a cellular phone. So it was a gradual interaction, interaction uh, between the people who made these things and the people who use them, uh, which moved it along in a given direction. And on the whole, that's the way productive technology, at least the way I've observed it, uh, um, uh, emerges and evolves, evolves over time. Uh, and it's in that sense that the technology is not uh, determined uh, by so, uh, that social policy and the technology are not determin uh, deterministic. They're very much their evolution is, and, and the way in which they evolve, evolve is very much um, situ, uh, situational. Uh, and, and again, to repeat what I, I, I've said, I think again and again, it depends on who interacts with whom and under what uh, uh, what uh, circumstances. So in some sense, the, the, uh, from that perspective, the most um, um, consequential change which has taken place in federal policy is not uh, uh, financing 
innovation policy. It's in the laws governing uh, what my um, uh, uh, colleague uh, um, uh, David Weil calls fissuring, because and and fissuring is 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 key because what's happened in through fissuring is that uh, that that employment has been broken out and subcontracted uh, from uh, large employers, which used to have a, a a large internal labor market where people of different educational. Uh, uh, levels and different backgrounds interacted with each other. So fissuring has taken the, the lowest um, wage and least skilled jobs and, and encouraged them to be broken off uh, from, uh, 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 from, from higher wage uh, employment and higher skilled employment opportunities and isolated uh, people without skills, uh, without entry level skills, uh, from the rest of the labor force, and and to the extent that technology is the outgrowth of the interaction of people, it has f forestalled certain kinds of interaction which used to take place, and 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 directed, if you will, the evolution of of technology in a particular way. So, in, in, so to go back to the question of what's the relationship between different kinds of policy, it's that po kind of policy which isolates uh, particular um, groups from each other, uh, which is of more concern, uh, to me anyway, than technological uh, and what goes on in the uh, National, National Science Foundation or in the government. Uh, in the government uh, labs. But there is, I think, uh, a, a relationship at a very different level between social and economic policy of which uh, the fissuring is, is kind of, um, uh, kind of uh, a, exemplary. And that is a tendency which I would call compartmentalization uh, in the sense that if you think that what fissuring is, it compartmentalizes workers of different skills and different backgrounds, in, in, and they have really very little to interaction with each other. And I must say, I mean, this is kind of a digression in this context, but I think of the, of the evolution that, that accompanies technology as being like the evolution of language. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think, um, and again, to, um, to drop a hint, but not to develop it or try not to develop it, I think that, that, that linguistic theory has a lot uh, to, to offer in terms of helping us to understand how practice evolves, practices in production and practices in, 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 um, in consumption. Um, but um, what um, I think one sees if one looks at, uh, at, at the way the economy evolves, certainly the American economy has evolved in recent years, is, is very much in, in, the, in, in the sense of increasing the walls or the difficulties in, in uh, co closing off the world of different institutions and different uh, people of different backgrounds. Uh, and so instead of having the interaction of, of, uh, of, of different backgrounds enriching the evolution, what we see is that they are increasingly unable to talk to, uh, to talk to or understand each other. Now, for me, this, this, this notion that, 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 um, uh, that, that, compartmentalization is a is is an important characteristic of the way in which the u.s uh, world um, evolves uh, emerged from the studies we were doing of um, of labor market regulation and in particular the contrast between the way in which we regulate work in the united states uh, and the way in which it's regulated in european and latin american uh, countries because in in the US, 
we have a, a series of work regulations ranging from the minimum wage to EOC uh, to health and safety regulation uh, to uh, union organization uh, to union collective to collective bargaining once the union is organized and so on. Each of those regulations is in a separate in, uh, institution. It's administered by uh, a separate. Um, uh, a, a, a separate uh, organization, and and in some and how separate they are, uh, actually, when we started studying uh, studying this, is truly shocking. Uh, for example, uh, both wages and hours, that is minimum wage regulation, and health and safety regulation, are housed in the Department of Labor, so they live next door to each other in the same in the same large organization, but they don't talk to each other. Uh, and, and the fact that, that one thinks they ought to talk to each other uh, shocks them when you begin to, shocks them almost as much as I was shocked to be told that I should be worrying more about um, uh, the interrelationship between um, social policy and innovation policy. Uh, but there's a norm that, um, now, the result of the fact that these are in different organizations, that they're closed off from each other, means that one looks at uh, uh, employment practices or work practices as a, as a list of things. And one thinks that one can correct them one by one by one. Uh, whereas the uh, employment practices are, um, at, uh, are much more likely to result uh, to be the outcome of managerial practices. And while we've uh, kind of maybe abused the, the idea uh, a lot in, 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 in popularization, we can talk about uh, uh, the low road and the high road in employment practices. And, uh, and, and, and in order to the high, the, high road and the low road are combinations of different approaches uh, to work and to manage managing work. And it's probably not possible to uh, raise the minimum wage in, in one sector of the economy in a permanent kind of way if you don't understand the context in which the firms that pay the minimum wage operate and the pressures which are on them in the uh, in the in in the marketplace, uh, and and try and relieve those pressures uh, in, enough so that people can uh, can that, that is once they pay the fine for the uh, or, re, or pay the back wages, they they don't go back uh, to a set of of, of operational procedures uh, that are only viable if you pay. <laughs> If you uh, uh, pay low wages or don't, um, and and violate the minimum wage, so the difference is that in Europe they have a generalized inspectorate, and one inspector or one uh, one organization uh, is responsible for the whole labor code. So when they go into an enterprise, instead of looking at, at a whole list of things. Uh, which is a list that is so long that, uh, particularly if you take the French Labor Code, which is a book like this, uh, they're almost forced by the structure of the organization in order uh, to look at the interrelationship uh, among the different violations that they, they spot and to encourage the firm uh, to adopt a different set of managerial practices and to think about uh, the leg the uh, environment in which they operated, and what kind of other uh, regulatory changes might uh, uh, be made in order to uh, uh, move the firm and its way of doing business into a realm that is consistent uh, with the regulations that are in, um, in, involved. So. Um, us, and we have been working with Janice Fine, who's been um, at, at Rutgers, who is uh, trying to um, upgrade uh, 
uh, state and local uh, uh, regulatory procedures. And, and, and there, that is another kind of dimension of the compartmentalization of different aspects of, of, of labor market uh, regulation. Uh, uh, but um, the, what, what, again, what keeps coming through is the resistance uh, of these different, uh, I, I don't want to use the term bureaucracy because it's a pejorative term, uh, but, of the, but, but these are small bureaucratic organizations with their, their own traditions, their own legal uh, departments, their own sense of how you go about regulating the labor market and how, but none of them have a sense uh, that what you need to do is to interact uh, across uh, uh, different um, uh, uh, different regula regulations and underlying to, to uh, emphasize the name of the book that that uh, um, uh, Andrew Shank and I uh, just produced uh, um, to emphasize root cause regulation. Now, I guess I, I'd like to conclude with two further th thoughts. One is to some extent, we, we have um, embodied the idea or we have um, in, 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 um, of compartmentalization in our um, analytical structures. And that's particularly true in our analysis of work with this emphasis on work as tasks. Uh, and I guess, uh, I, and in that sense, I want to pick up this uh, point that John Paul made, uh, that, that is to divide everything into elementary tasks, is to leave the impression uh, that you can change the world task by task. It's to take Adam Smith's pin factory example uh, and reify it in uh, to a way of looking at uh, and uh, economic development and economic growth through specialization. Uh, that is, it may make sense to uh, uh, have uh, automated each of the uh, uh, tasks involved in pin, pin making uh, separately and to separate them out. Uh, but I would submit that that's a, a rare a case. And again, to point to my colleague over here, uh, the difference, a fundamental difference between Japanese management and, uh, and U.S. automobile management is that in the U.S. we tend to look for things, to, to we look at operations, we want to separate out operations, each operation, and to look at it and analyze it in isolation from everything else. So we have built up in process inventories between in effect the different uh, operations on the pin factory. Uh, so, uh, so if the uh, pin heading machine breaks down, uh, you still have uh, a pin pointing inventory of, uh, uh, of, of uh, parts that can go on while you try and, and fix the um, uh, the single operation that you've had um, had problems with, but it leads to a way of looking at the world uh, in which you don't see the interconnection between the different uh, different uh, different pieces, uh, and you don't see uh, uh, technology as a process which un unfolds over time, uh, and, and 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 in doing that, you sort of move away from looking at the context in which uh, people are operating in the workplace, the context that's pushing technology in one direction or, 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 or another. So I guess I think that um, uh, we, our uh, difficulties in technology require more uh, than uh, just an increase in resources and research and development but it requires a difference in the way in which we think about uh, the operations, not just of work. And I, I 
think another mistake we make is thinking of work technologies and consumption technologies as being independent or, or separable from each other. Um, but let me conclude with just the final leap in, 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 in this. And that is to, uh, to say that in a way, what the pundits are saying uh, about how we got into the present moment in politics, that the uh, difficulty uh, of uh, 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 the left and the right working together is, is again, uh, an issue of compartmentalization uh, that and and that we no longer have interact with each other, and so uh, if if language is the right analogy for all of this, we no longer even speak the same the same language, and and to get to speak to the same language, uh, we need. Uh, we need to talk to each other. Language that is um, language does, uh, in operation doesn't develop in the class in, in a classroom, which is teaching uh, uh, grammar, uh, but it um, uh, develops through people talking to each other, uh, so that their uh, uh, perspectives on the world somehow they may not merge, but they need to be interact and, and, and exchange. And I certainly think that that's in order to understand the way in which technology operates in the workplace, uh, that is a, le uh, a lesson which is, uh, which is fundamental. Thank you. Great, well, um, this has been just amazing um, and very, very hard to follow Professor Priore, of course. Um, but I have some, some general comments building on my own research that I think speak to the comments of the three panelists. And forgive me, I, um, I got in from a red eye three hours ago and I also forgot my glasses. So <laughs> this is um, this is a very a very blurry um, blurry talk I'm about to give. So we've heard in a sense um, from each of our panelists these sort of macro perspectives on the role of tech in society. Um, from John Paul, we heard um, case studies about of, of machines over time, the long term societal impacts um, of job loss and job displacement. He urged us to think about. Um, about automation through tasks and not skills, and also really pushed back against the kind of technological determinism that undergirds much of um, the innovation policy um, that, that Michael um, spoke about. Uh, Bob, in some ways, appropriately followed, um, speaking to the perplexing inverse relationship between productivity growth and technological innovation in the last many years, and um, pointing to the relative on importance um, and the limitations of robots, something that, again, um, maybe is counterintuitive if you just read sort of the Silicon Valley rags. Um, and finally, uh, Michael Pure focused on the study of social policy and innovation policy, uh, teaching us to think about how compartmentalization, both in analysis, um, research, and I think more importantly, in dialogue, um, in conversation, the dialectical relationship between um, social policy and innovation policy really inhibits our ability to address, um, address the problems that emerge um, in the world of technology and work. So before I sort of respond to my interlocutories, interlocutors with my own commentary, I want to situate myself in my research. Um, I should say at the outset that, as you heard, I'm a law professor, but also a legal and cultural anthropologist whose research on immigrant taxi workers in San Francisco was disrupted by the advent of Uber, Lyft, and their erstwhile competitor sidecar. Um, this disruption almost a full decade ago forced me to think critically about the role of law technology in, in law and technology in society and the world of work um, in a way that I had not anticipated or frankly desired. Um, it was in an organizing meeting of taxi workers who were opposing the sale of medallions in San Francisco that I first heard about these bandit tech cabs. 
Um, drivers hailed by an application driving in their own vehicles and cutting in line at hotels to nab highly lucrative airport runs from taxi workers who were waiting their turn. But what I learned from the taxi workers was that Uber and Lyft's primary innovation in that moment, things have changed, but in that moment, their primary innovation was not technology. Indeed, San Francisco taxi workers had been using Cabulous, a centralized dispatch app, for a few years and had even advocated for municipal agencies to adopt it and integrate it into the larger public transportation system. What the companies innovated was new levels of brazen rule breaking as a business model analogous, perhaps, to FedEx in the years before rule breaking that was funded with and through never before heard levels of venture capital, um, which was again itself the outcome of shifting rules and regulations in the 70s, 80s and 90s. So using both soft power and hard power and operating in the shadows of the Great Recession, these San Francisco startups convinced local and state regulators to avert their eyes, even as workers were laboring in what was essentially an informal economy without labor protections, but also without appropriate insurance and in what, according to OSHA, was one of the most dangerous jobs in the world. Indeed, regulatory oversight, the first in the entire world of these companies, took place almost two years in following the tragic death of five-year-old Sophia Liu on New Year's Eve in San Francisco. She was killed by a taxi, uh, an Uber driver um, as she was in a crosswalk. I offer that small vignette from early in my research, not only to situate myself and my own thinking um, in these debates, but also to make the broader point that while, while technology matters, as we think about the worlds of work, um, their impacts on equality and inequality um, looming in our collective futures, laws matter more and perhaps regulatory enforcement matters the most. And I think that's sort of where all of our, uh, all of our panelists kind of left off or ended. And this leads me to one specific thread that I think has emerged in this series of fantastic presentations. So Bob ins insightfully asks us to consider that when we think of the future of work and automation, our concern should not be about the lack of jobs, but the kinds of jobs. Um, and this point, of course, dovetails nicely with Michael's insight insights about the disconnect between innovation policy and social policy, and um, in, in John Paul's discussion on sort of the myopic focus um, on in automation policy discussions um, that fail to look at systems level uh, organization um, and, and really sort of focus uh, sort of as in his terms very myopically. And these points and provocations that our interlocutors have made together not only point to a, need, to a need to think differently about the future of work, but also to overcome and reject the ideological commitment to technological determinism and optimism, which results not only in bad or wrong analysis, but also in bad and wrong regulation. So allow me a historical analogy. At the turn of the 19th century, the cotton mill was symbolically equated with the new industrial society. Um, E.P. Thompson famously noted that the cotton mill was a novel piece of industrial technology representing both new forms of production and importantly, the social relationship that those new forms of production entailed. But the cotton mill, or the satanic mill, as, as Carl Pogliani called it, um, was of course not the driving force behind the grinding of men into masses and the enormous political, social, and economic upheavals of the Industrial Revolution. These transformations were attributable not to the machine, but to capital's rapid restructuring of work around the machine to the state's non-interventionist response to that restructuring, and to the collective resistance of the working class amidst public and private reorderings of work. So for a moment, just humor me, let's think of AI technology, automation technology as the symbolic cotton mill in today's rapidly growing digital economy. I want to argue that just as capital intensive, the capital intensive nature of unregulated factory production amidst the industrial revolution expropriated and exploited human labor, today's AI tech and AI companies with their venture capital facilitated business models, monopoly and monopsony guided ideologies and resistance to regulation create and rely upon profoundly immoral economies of work. 
in most imaginaries, not, in, not on our panel, but in most imaginaries of this looming displacement of workers caused by automation, power is concentrated in entrepreneurial innovators and their engineers whose algorithms and machines aspire to mimic tasks or services traditionally completed by humans, as John Paul um, explained to us. But I want to underscore that central to the infrastructure of artificial intelligence and automation more broadly is the labor produced through global supply chains of dispersed and atomized data workers who pick, clean, label, and otherwise process the data that artificial intelligence cannot. In this sense, even optimistic forecasts about automation must be understood as it has been understood on our panel today, not as labor replacement, but as broad scale labor displacement. Engineers use these data workers I speak of, accessing th them through computing crowds on labor platforms like Crowdflower, Clickworker, and most commonly Amazon Mechanical Turk for cheap, fast performance. Workers concentrated both in the US and in the global south, namely in India, the Philippines, and secretly in Madagascar, um, are paid not for their time, but by the task. We're quickly earning in the US an average of $2 per hour. And this is, you know, very much emerges from um, what Michael Pure referenced um, in, in terms of, of David Weil's conceptualization of the fissuring of work. So the development of auto autonomous vehicle technology, for example, is an instructional example of this invisibility and the lack of regulation over this really foundational labor. So for technology industrialists, the development of AV technology is an attempt to create fleets of private vehicles for the transport of goods and bodies that generate profit without the overhead of labor costs, that is, without human workers. And we know, of course, and hopefully get to this in the Q of A, that in fact, that the sort of, uh, um, what is it called, standard for or the um, uh, Q? Q yeah, was, was sort of, you know, perhaps not possible. Um, despite early manic projections that self-driving cars would replace ride hail and truck di drivers by 2019, engineers now prognosticate that fully autonomous vehicles will be unavailable for half a century if then. And meanwhile, any AV advancements rely upon a long and complicated supply chain of dispersed data workers, many of whom complete individual tasks but have no idea what they're working on, again, the compartmentalization. And, and, and in the process, the, um, I, I want to emphasize that the sort of the role, the ideological role of looming, looming displacement of workers by fully autonomous vehicles actually works to stave off appropriate regulations. These data workers include Uber drivers who produce and collect data about their labor, about cities, about speed and traffic patterns, the temporary and contracted workers who drive LIDAR censored equipped vehicles to acquire data images of driving environments, the workers in the US and globally who label, organize and manage that data to feed AV AI systems, and the millions of temporary workers from staffing agencies who are hired by tech firms to labor as, labor as low level engineers. At almost every stage of this long and complicated data supply chain that produces basic AI infrastructural and infrastructures, digital peace workers labor outside the boundaries of employment protections, conducting time intensive tasks that are and will continue to be integral to the success of the technology itself. Though critical, these workers remain unseen, including to those charged with the enforcement of work laws. Again, auto automation here is not labor replacement, but labor displacement. From the perspective of technology capitalists, the practice of paying people by the piece who work perhaps in their own homes to clean the data, to label the data, and ostensibly on their own schedules is an innovation, a new kind of labor arrangement to lower overhead and introduce speed and flexibility to production. As, as Amazon Mechanical Turk advertises to requesters, including tech companies and researchers, it's a quote, good way to break down a manual time consuming project into smaller, more manageable tasks to be completed by distributed workers over the internet, end quote. Technology capitalists in the US who utilize these home workers through hiring entities like Amazon Mechanical Turk are unburdened with the risks and expenses associated with being an employer. Requesters can hire workers with the click of a button and terminate them just as quickly. Unlike with employee layoffs, these terminations are neither reported to state authorities nor do they trigger, trigger legal, legal liabilities. 
Absent a supervisor, the way in which workers are paid by the piece and without a wage floor ties remuneration directly to production speed. But the payment per task is so low that a 2018 study found that the average hourly wage of an AMT data home worker in the US, in the US is roughly $2 per hour. So in contrast to an earlier era of homework, um, and despite staggeringly low pay, this digital data work has garnered little to no attention from regulators. The growing informal data economy has been largely understood even by critics as a new kind of work, rather than as a revived and, might I add, reviled labor process deserving of reform. What I'm getting at, of course, with both my Uber anecdote and this story about the disaggregation of the labor supply chain and AI production is that what is most relevant as we see record levels of inequality, not only in this country, but globally, and we have to situate our conversations about the world of work, particularly as it relates to AI in global terms, is expressly not innovation policy, but rather the need to use social policy to guide innovation. And recently, the EU's guidance on new laws to govern platform work just released in the last few weeks has signaled a move in this direction. But in the US, with a very limited understanding on data at work, the very watered down version of the GDPR we have in California and nowhere else, and the reticence about the federal and state level enforcement agencies you all surely saw recently that David Weil was not confirmed as the new wage and hour administrator, despite the fact that he had done that job and done that job well under Obama, precisely because of his position on how these types of workers are, are uh, should be categories and how they, how they should be treated. Um, without this sort of uh, uh, desire at the federal and state level to enforce existing laws for fear of being in one of my um, interviews, interviewees terms out lawyered and over papered by the technology companies, um, it has left us with a profoundly unsettling present and future of work, um, especially as it relates to technology. And I'm frequently reminded of a letter, I think about this letter every day, that I found in the course of, of my archival research on the relationship between labor and technological shifts. The letter, some of you might have seen, um, was written in 1949 by Norbert Wiener, the father of cybernetics theory. He wrote this, um, this letter uh, in his, from his lab at MIT in 1949 to the president of the UAW, to Walter Ruther, um, in Detroit, informing him that members of the auto industry were asking for his contributions to develop autonomous machinery for factory production. Wiener told Ruther that the technology to create the machinery is easy. But he hoped that the union, the workers on the shop floor, would join the movement against autonomous machines because of the larger social harms that they would entail. He said he wasn't going to acquiesce and work on these technologies because of their social implications, but he knew that others would. So I want to end my comments today um, by, you know, really extending, I think, what, what in particular um, Michael and John Paul um, said their points about techno, techno determinism um, versus volunteerism, about thinking um, not through uh, thinking, thinking about these issues without compartmentalizing them, trying to think about this through systems theory, um, that in this historic moment of rapid technological upheaval, we have to, as scholars, as researchers, and maybe most importantly, as, as state officials, um, focus not just on the AI and automation technology itself, um, prognosticating what futures they may or may not bring, but engage in intentional interventions in technological production whether through shop floor union organizing, labor law innovations, or business regulations, we have to, to be ready and willing to discourage and prevent technological development where necessary. And we must be guided not, um, as every panelist in this, in this panel has already emphasized, not by sci-fi fantasies, but by the conviction that we absolutely have the power to use law and policy to shape moral, equitable, and democratic worlds of work. Um, we can do this, and again, you know, referencing um, the way that Michael Pure put this quite beautifully, um, we can do this not through just work law regulations, but also through monopoly regulations, through antitrust law, um, through pricing policies. There is profound room for, um, for social innovation um, in relationship to this, um, in, in relationship to these shifting technologies. So I wanted to end with those comments and I look forward to the conversations amongst our panelists. I invite you to, um, 
to sit at this lovely setup up here and um, and and for everyone in the room to sort of engage in conversations. And I assume you, you will um, field questions. I have a question for Michael. Um, so you talked sort of at the end of your, of, of the um, conversation about how, um, you know, and this has been sort of a, your work for a long time, how employment practices, um, employment laws are sort of secondary in real life to managerial decision-making. And I think that that's been right for a long time, but I wonder what you think of this sort of idea that, is, that I've been thinking through. Um, in looking at a place, again, the, the, the informal tech economy, looking at a place where workers are, 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 are labor without any kind of employment protections at all, what I've seen is the development of of AI alongside social psychology to shape how workers behave um, in a way that maybe is not traditional, in, uh, indicative of traditional control. So rather than just telling a worker, no, you cannot say, uh, you cannot reject a ride, um, you teach a worker through various punishments, um, AI punishments, to realize that if they don't take that ride, then they're not going to get another one for a long time. And in that sense, I think that there's been, um, there's sort of been this sort of managerial decision making that becomes infused through AI that is a direct relationship to a rejection of employment relations, if that makes sense. Does that make sense to you? I, I really don't know how to respond, <laughs> respond in the sense that I, I think that um, uh, I, I don't know about social psychology. I mean, I, this is just, it, it's not exactly new to me, but I, it, I've never really um, focused on, 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 on how, what it means as a managerial, uh, a managerial tool. I think that um, I, I, I would be more concerned than I, I am more concerned, perhaps wrongly, uh, about the way in which these new technologies have, uh, serve as distant control. Yes. Uh, and and um, that um, uh, and 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 lay out. I mean, for, just to take an example, which actually comes from Mexico, but uh, at some point I was looking at. Um, the way in which the Mexican work inspectors were using um, uh, remote um, inf control information. And there are really two ways in which they do it, but one is that you increase the re regimentation of the, uh, so that, uh, because you know where people are at any moment of time, even the, in, uh, you, you you direct you try and direct control every minute of their their life and push them into a uh, a protocol uh, and and I think that that not only is that a problem I mean a, a human relations problem should we say uh, but it's also due to a, a um, poverty of imagination of the man that is here you. You 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 give managers a, a new te technology, and 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 they have the opportunity to to use it any way they want, but the only way they can think of using it is to increase increase control, uh, and 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 so the question is how do you teach people that there are other ways of 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 managing than than. Uh, than control, than control. I mean, a lot, a lot, what control looks like in, in some of the sectors that I study is, um, is sort of like a gambling machine, right? Like all of these ways in which you train the human mind to behave in a very particular way that leads to self-exploitation. And I think at first glance, that sounds like freedom, right? That's like, sounds like a, an absence of control. Um, but it's not, and certainly not experienced in that way. Yeah, I've got a mic 
Um, so I just wanted to pick up on uh, your question with reference to some of the work that my colleague Lindsay Cameron does, and I know you, you know about this, but she builds nicely on the Michael Burroway work on sort of making out and games in the workplace to sort of capture worker uh, attention and 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 motivation and consciousness and and in her work on i think mostly uber drivers she talks about some drivers who play efficiency games and some who play relational games i'm going to try to relate it to your question about does this does this take you away from an employment mindset the interesting thing about the efficiency game is sometimes these are people who want to kind of follow the rules so well that they maximize their earnings from the app or that they want to subvert and find workarounds, sometimes involving information sharing with other drivers, to maximize their outcomes or economic outcomes. Mostly, they're more likely to be working multiple platforms as well in order to do that. Now, you could say, even if they think they're subverting, they're still playing the game, and that that may um, therefore uh, still accomplish some of the goals of of a kind of control system. But um, the thing I wanted to say in relation to your question, I wonder if the drivers that are more inclined towards a relational game, which is they actually try to create a relationship with the customers that feels good to them, but also generates high ratings, which does have some economic payoff for them, if they might identify more with a sort of a, a, a purpose around customer service that would be more compatible with employment mm -hmm. for that employer in a way that the efficiency game doesn't because it actually encourages disloyalty or switching and, and, and having multiple uh, platforms that you work on. So I wonder if that could be one way. It's all, it's all games, it's all forms of control, but one may align a little better with employment and the other, I think very much not. Uh, first of all, do, do we have any other questions from the audience? Oh, we do. Okay. Go ahead. Oh, whatever. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Thanks for excellent, stimulating um, presentations. Um, I have one question for Robert Gordon. I wish you were here in the room with us because I am a big fan of your book. So Can you hear I me? So do I, which I was in the room. <laughs> anyway, um, so your general topic was about stagnation versus growth and so on. And I just would like to hear a little bit more about um, the relationship of that question to the dichotomy between manufacturing and services, which you kind of touched on in a different context. Um, I'm a fan of this recent book by Aaron Benevev that you probably know of, Automation and the Future of Work. Where he basically argues, and I think other people have argued this, including someone who, oh, who was here earlier, oh, John Zeisman, um, that manufacturing is sort of inherently uh, more uh, capable of, or uh, you know, um, that productivity growth is much easier to attain within manufacturing than within services, which are somehow inherently more stagnant. And so I just kind of wonder um, if you think that's right, and if so, how it fits with those charts you showed us about how lately productivity growth has actually been higher in services. Can I ask a second question while I have the floor for a different person? And then I'll stop. Um, which my next one is for you, Vina. I was very taken by what you said about piecework at Mechanical Turk, but I think that is not just at Mechanical Turk. I would argue that Uber is piecework too. Instacart is piecework, all of them are. And the pay rates are a little better, not that much better, but a little better in those place bound ones because Mechanical Turk can access the entire global workforce and the others are more tied to a particular place. So, the, so what is that all about? Piecework never completely disappeared, but I'm curious, I would just like to hear what everybody thinks about what the implications of its revival in this new form are. Oh, and also on gamification, which is what some people call it in that um, it's not just Uber and um, those apps that are doing it, but I'm kind of obsessed with Amazon these days, and some of you have probably have read the same reports I have about how they've introduced video games at the workstations in the so-called fulfillment centers, the warehouses. Um, they're not required, but the idea is to seduce workers into 
playing those games. So this is kind of emerging in a lot of yeah. different arenas. Thanks. Can you Bob, hear do me? You Yep. Can you, you can hear me. Okay. Uh, about manufacturing, over the broad sweep of the post-war years, manufacturing productivity growth chugged along steadily at around 3% a year, much faster than in the services. And you're right that manufacturing uh, was easier to automate, uh, was easier to bring machines to do work uh, on assembly lines. Uh, and that heightens the puzzle of why it turned around and grew so much slower than services uh, in the last 10 years. Uh, I've been conducting research on that uh, and uh, it does seem consistent with the view that uh, the best opportunities, the lowest hanging fruit for automation uh, were exhausted uh, by 2005, 2010. And so the uh, modest revival we're getting in the last two years uh, is, uh, is welcome, uh, but still leaves the broader question of why, to take up your question, uh, why isn't manufacturing where we would expect to see uh, the biggest effect of, um, of machines replacing men? On uh, Vina's uh, comment about data entry work, uh, I wanted to highlight my chart, which showed the decline in the work of uh, auditors uh, and bookkeepers and the increase in financial management uh, and financial advisors as a result of the invention of the spreadsheet. Uh, there's nothing more stultifying than the kind of data entry work that people used to do back before the age of the computer. Endless grinding away on mechanical calculators that went clunk, clunk, clunk to do a single multiplication. Imagine the uh, difference uh, between uh, entering data on a, on a computer, which is now more and more done by other computers. Uh, I think the, uh, the change in, uh, uh, to, to take that interesting list of the new occupations that David Otter and his group found, all those new occupations uh, since 1940, uh, you look down that list, many of them are just inherently more interesting work uh, than what people were doing before 1940 in the mechanical uh, rote jobs on assembly lines and in uh, clerical uh, work in the pre-computer age. Uh, so to answer your question, yes. I mean, I, I have um, an article about how this is all piecework. Um, so <laughs> I wholeheartedly agree with you that so much of this is, is about piecework. And so I'll say two things. Um, so in a, in a piece that is just hopefully coming out this week or maybe early next week in the Harvard Law and Policy Review um, called the New Racial Wage Code, what I talk about is how the primary innovation of um, of the what you know what we call gig work, but it's like the classification is what makes it gig work. These are actually enti entirely different sectors of work, and I don't, I don't want to be clumsy about falling into this sort of um, naming of it as gig work. But what we see in food um, food delivery and ride the ride hail sector um, is the emergence through you know wide scale expensive lobbying of a third category of work, as you know. Um, and the primary innovation that I argue in this piece, the new racial wage code of this new category of work is making it piecework. And what it what is what is scary about it is that it is not piecework like um, like the piecework that immigrant women got at the early part of the 20th century before it's about abol being abolished by the FLSA. What it is is work that is sort of in two additional degrees um, unpredictable and insecure. It is unpredictable and insecure because for the first time ever in law and policy, you have this invention of um, what is called, what the companies and now the laws call engaged time. So you only get paid after your allocated work. 
And as soon as you drop off a person, um, you are no longer getting paid. And so they guarantee a minimum earning standard for that time period. And that sounds really great. And they talk about it as though it were a minimum wage. But the problem with this is that the non-engaged time is also completely unpredictable. And it is completely unpredictable, not because of demand and fluctuations of demand, which is, of course, part of it, but also because of the way that work is allocated, going back to the gamification going back to systems of control, you cannot, you have no control over when or why or how you are actually allocated a piece to be paid for. So what emerges, because during that time that you, you are paid, it no longer in many jurisdictions is about, um, is about time and mileage, but actually is a price that emerges through black box algorithms, pricing that is allocated through price box algorithms, um, is what I merge what what I call labor price discrimination, where what I might get for um, for uh, a piece is not what you get for a piece because Uber knows everything about how much I need to earn and how little they need to pay me in order for me to continue to get me to work, and that is very frightening, um, given the fact that they also know so much about my financial history, they know so much about my location history, they know I mean. It is very frightening because a lot of that data is then sold to downstream um, predatory financial markets where I um, get advertisements from payday loan uh, lenders, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, and there's, of course, a real interrelationship here between this notion of engaged time it now now embedded in the law in both Washington state and California um, and uh, and the idea that these by by and large immigrant racial minority workers um, are are also become sort of incapable of any kind of upward mobility um, really inhibited by systems of uh, of debt and debt creation um, that that work alongside the labor price discrimination and your question is really like well what is this about and i think i, I when i think about it i don't think of it as being really any different than the many decades of efforts by the chamber of commerce to eliminate the minimum wage it is a very, um, very the sort of the arguments that are made around disemployment, um, all, all of the sort of discussion about why we need a third category of work. It dovetails quite clearly um, with the things that the Manufacturing Association was saying during the New Deal and the things that the Chamber of Commerce has been has been advertising ever since. And what's sort of I think what has made it possible, though, is the shiny veneer of technology and impossible streams of venture capital. Um, um, to sell that technology. I wanted to uh, I wanted to just make a contrast, however, between the taxi driver and the Uber driver. One big difference is the taxi driver spends an awful lot of time sitting and waiting without being paid. Uh, and the technology that allows the Uber driver to be constantly engaged for money uh, due to variable pricing, um, and the computer algorithm of matching rides to drivers uh, means that that driver is engaged a higher percentage of his or her time and has the flexibility to quit and to go home and to engage in whatever leisure activities they want at whatever, the, at whatever point they want. So a higher percentage of their day at work is spent actually driving. So David, I would push back, I'm sorry, uh, Bob, I would push back against that, um, given that this is what I've done ethnographically for the past decade, a study the differences between how people work in the taxi industry versus how people, in a regulated tax in industry versus how people work in um, in in the Uber and Lyft context. Um, Non-engaged time, according to industry studies, is about 40% taxi, taxi workers in my own, work, in my own um, research who are in a very concentrated urban environment will tell you that their unengaged time is closer to 40 to 60 percent, um, which actually is in part due to the unregulated nature of vehicle caps. So in addition to the fact that they have no idea when they're going to get work because it's actually not based on some efficiency system, or at least efficiency system alone, there are an unregulated number of vehicles and of supply on the street at any given time. Um, in the taxi industry, by sharp contrast, since um, at least the 1930s, in fact, during the Great Depression in large urban areas all over the country, you had unions join hands with consumer advocacy groups to push for vehicle caps and fare regulations in the effort 
effort there was to ensure that workers could uh, make some semblance of a living um, uh, or, or even higher than the minimum wage, even though they were guaranteed what was a minimum wage under uh, existing union contracts, make much higher than that because they were able to calibrate um, supply and demand in a way that isn't possible when you have no um, no no vehicle caps and no and no fair regulation. Um, the idea that an Uber and Lyft driver can just go home and have fun whenever they want to is, I think, a real fiction that has emerged from industry discourse. In fact, um, drivers are told that the beginning of each, each week when they should work in order to make a living. So unlike what Dara Khosrowshahi says in his propaganda about how you can just turn on your app and earn whenever you want to, um, Uber actually tells drivers that if based on data analytics from the previous week, that if they don't work between Thursday, uh, Thursday between four and six, they're actually not going to make any money because their vehicle expenses, their capital overhead is so extreme and so high. And so while taxi workers actually, um, as I said in my, my talk actually had a centralized dispatch app that was uh, worked worked through the logic of efficiency um, while they had the freedom to stop and have coffee because they were had higher earnings um, I, I i might say that in my drivers and my research will tell you that that flexibility is gone they sleep in their car they eat in their car and they work in their cars I've driven cab a lot of times, and it's not like what you just described. And I've driven it, maybe San Francisco is different, but I've driven it in two big cities, Chicago and Detroit. That is not how we got taxis. And that's not, we, the most unionized place in the country was Detroit, and that was not unionized. And let me say that the, that the way in which it was regulated and the time in which we had was more like what Bob has spoken about than the way you've described. And and that's and what I would say to you is is that the what we were actually it was a, like you describe a centralized system that had a dispatch system, but that you, unless you paid the dispatcher, unless everyone and you think I'm just making a joke or something, unless you paid the dispatcher, you didn't get a call. Yeah. So a lot of your income had to go to the dispatcher before you actually got calls. So, and you only had a certain time to be able to drive the car. Right. So it, you didn't own it. And on top of that, you actually had to pay a fee to get the car in the first place right. each and every day. Yeah, and I mean, what you're describing is a very particular regulatory system. Um, there are others that have emerged both in San Francisco and beyond where you have long-term leasing, where you actually can work whenever you when, whenever you whenever you need or whatever wherever wherever you want but the system of graft etc is certainly there but i will tell you from studying the taxi industry in san francisco for almost a decade and also studying the uber industry that the amount of money that taxi workers were able to make in this very precarious system i mean the reason that i studied the taxi industry prior to the advent of uber was because i saw it as a highly exploitative system um, that existed, you know, taxi companies were the first um, alongside trucking companies to go the independent contractor route um, and de-unionize the workforce. What you had though, because there was the, there had been a union present was fair re regulations and vehicle caps, at least in cities like San Francisco and New York, um, that made it possible in good times to make a middle-class living and to aspire towards um, medallion uh, uh, holding in San Francisco, they were not um, they were not commodified medallions, so you didn't have the like the the downward pressure on worker wages. Um, but but the difference in wages, which had a direct impact on how long people had to work in the taxi industry, particularly long term leaseholders, was in a matter of two years, 65%. Both Uber drivers and taxi drivers were making 65% of what taxi workers were making six years prior or four years prior um, as a direct result of the complete lack of fare regulation and vehicle caps. So I want to be careful about valorizing sort of the flexibility that, that we talk about when we, um, when we talk about Uber and also be careful about valorizing what was not a good industry. I mean, the reason that I studied it is because it was so precarious and so uncertain. Um, but I think it's I think it's important to, to note at, at a bottom level, the lack of regulatory infrastructure that is the direct result of law breaking has resulted in the kinds of, of um, 
I mean, I have taxi driver friends who have died over the last year in their cars from heart attacks because of the conditions um, that now exist. It is 10 times worse than what it had been a decade ago. Let me, uh, let me generalize this and get out of the exclusive attention to the taxi and Uber industry. Um, when, when economists talk about free trade, uh, they emphasize that there are losers and winners. Uh, from free trade, the winners are consumers that get a greater variety of goods at lower prices, and the workers in export-oriented industries, like making Boeing airplanes, uh, which have a bigger market overseas, uh, because generally our low tariffs are reciprocated by other countries. And the losers, of course, are those who work in factories uh, competing with the imports, where factories are closed down, and often these workers are unemployed, unable to move to other cities because their houses have lost value and they can't afford to move. Uh, so we have this uh, dichotomy between the winners and the losers. And I would certainly grant you that taxi drivers and Uber drivers are worse off today than taxi drivers were before 2010. Uh, but the same thing is true uh, in the taxi industry as in free trade. You have millions of customers that are better off because they can get a ride instantly wherever they want without having to go and find where taxis are located uh, in a few taxi stands uh, in the center part of the city. And Uber has been a great boon to minority groups and inhabitants in parts of town which never used to see a taxi. Uh, so uh, just remember, we have to balance uh, the concentrated losses against the widespread gains in talking about both free trade and taxis. But also it's important to note that these same, that all of the, the ability to get a ride like this means the displacement of millions of dollars from public transportation that those low income minority people that you're talking about have long relied upon. And those workers are now being price gouged by Uber because of a lack of price control in the industry. Um, I, I wanted to thank everybody for the presentations and Vina for her comments, but to also go back to Robert Gordon's presentation, which was wonderfully helpful in presenting information. And then at the very end, you said something about immigration policy. But, but really what I'm asking is to go back, maybe for all of you, to in, in just kind of small comments about what are the policy implications of what you're saying because you you did conclude robert by saying that you didn't really see growth changing into the future then you brought up immigration policy but you didn't bring much up much more concretely in terms of what are the policy implications of your analysis and i thought you know um i i i was listening very closely to the other presentations also but i i just wanted to return to the level of policy implications. And so they're broad analyses, but more you know, specifically educational policy, et cetera. Just if you could say a little more anybody on the panel about policy implications, I'd appreciate I, it. I would love to pick this up and go beyond immigration policy where we have models of Canada, which uh, takes in three times as many immigrants per capita as we used to before the Trump administration. And of course, since Trump, we're bringing in far fewer uh, uh, immigrants. And we have a, a nation with stark shortages in, uh, in labor uh, supply in many different industries uh, with uh, ample room to bring in uh, immigrants. Uh, I'm strongly in favor of a policy like Canada and Australia where points are given to prospective immigrants for their uh, language and employment uh, capabilities and education. Uh, speaking of education, uh, I think we have to uh, do as much as we can for those who are displaced from outsourcing, automation, and all the reasons that uh, factory jobs have uh, declined by 7 million jobs in the last 40 years. Um, and uh, when talking about training, uh, we need a much better route for students who don't want to go to college or can't go to college through a German type apprenticeship system, uh, which is only uh, peripherally uh, developed in the United States through uh, occasional relations between 
uh, community colleges and nearby firms, some of which, by the way, are German transplant uh, uh, factories like BMW in South Carolina. Uh, more generally, uh, we need to have a, a, a system which uh, has more rights for unions, higher minimum wage, and uh, uh, higher taxes on wealthy uh, people, uh, a whole political agenda that we're familiar with that sounds a lot like uh, France or Germany or uh, Scandinavia, but which has been made virtually impossible in this country by a set of cultural uh, divisions uh, which have made the right wing um, much stronger than it should be given the economic incentive of low income people to vote for um, a more egalitarian system. Um, one of the great mysteries to economists, uh, and perhaps less of a mystery to political scientists, is why low income people uh, continue to vote for a party uh, which favors low taxes on the rich. If you wanted me to broaden out the topic of this session, I just did it. I'll just add something very, very quick, uh, because Bob said a lot of, I think, the, the key things. Um, this is really something I learned from Erica Groshen in working on that report. Um, there's a lot of different training programs for retraining workers in these various situations, and they're very compartmentalized. And they tend to have a lot of very detailed criteria for whether you qualify or not. And, and so somebody may qualify for one thing and not another. So her policy recommendation in a, you know, sort of this narrow area was do away with all of the criteria for what exactly is the reason that you're in the need for retraining. And then she also said, you know, these, some of these programs are, are much better than others. Then you could apply broadly the lessons of which are the better design programs, and you could let a lot of people in and not worry about so much whether, but the, the tendency of the legislation and the and the, the regulators and the bureaucrats has been to compartmentalize them. And I didn't realize how much the compartmentalization exists even within DOL, for example. I would also just, I would just push back slightly against us always thinking about immigration policy in relationship to work. I think what gets left out in the discussion, uh, that this discussion we've been having largely in terms of emphasis is how little attention we pay to displaced workers at a time when the economy was shifting uh, towards um, New York and, uh, and, and San Francisco, and how much the resentment of the um, uh, uh, left-wing, right-wing uh, um, electorate uh, reflects the fact that, that, that nothing was really done uh, to compensate the people who paid for the expansion. And I don't think we have the institutions for compensation. So I, I, I guess I think that more should have been done and more needs to be done to pay attention to how the geographic location of economic prosperity is changing and, and to remedy that through direct policy inter, in, in, inter, interventions. Uh, I think it's all, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm as guilty of anybody as saying, you know, that, well, uh, there should be enough gains from trade in order to pay off the losers. But the fact of the matter is the losers have not can, been pay, paid off. We haven't even tried to. And uh, I guess I also think that the emphasis on training is that, that is become it's become a cliche and somehow our, our institutions uh, it, it's great to say junior college we need more junior college uh, but the uh, the, the uh, structure of junior college does not suggest that it's going to be a, a, a route to remedy the um, uh, the 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 problem on immigration, I, I think immigration is about to be blown. That is between dropping the uh, controls on the southern border and dealing with the refugees out of uh, the Ukraine and our immigration 
the the issue of immigration is blowing up before our, before our eyes, and um, uh, I think all of the uh, 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 parameters of immigration of the immigration debate uh, are about to shift. Uh, one additional thought on social policy. Um, we have a big problem of low achievement of minority groups in secondary and elementary school um, because there's a big vocabulary gap uh, between uh, children whose parents have gone to college and those who are growing up with single mothers and uh, who don't have college backgrounds. Uh, and that that suggests a much bigger role for subsidized preschool, uh, something that was on the Biden agenda that got uh, cut out like so much. Uh, but if we wanted to pick and choose among which of these social policies would make a difference, I think really early intervention with tutoring and uh, subsidized or free preschool education would be a place I would start. So I, I, I think uh, the clock is running out on us. Is that right? That's right. We're yeah, yeah. running short okay. on time, but I think you should yeah. hear this question. Okay, from, go ahead. Um, Deborah Lustig, Deborah Friedman Lustig from the Institute for Societal Studies. Um, I'm sorry, for the Institute for the Study of Societal Issues, of course. Um, she's joining us on Zoom today, and she asks, in advance of tomorrow's panel on the state's role in managing technology and society, I would like to hear from Vina Dubal about what she sees as possibly effective policy. It seems like even though there have been attempts to regulate these new tech peace workers, the industry has been successful in evading regulation. Okay, so two things. Um, one, I think the, you know, it would have been amazing if the PRO Act would be possible. I don't know that it is possible with our, um, with our our friends mansion and cinema, um, but uh, you know, making what we've seen, we have record high numbers of people interested in unions, interested in organizing. Um, I firmly believe that rank and file organizing, like we've recently seen at the Amazon Labor Union in Staten Island, is the road alongside the the growth of um, of the protection of labor organizing to towards actually regulating these spaces. Um, in ways that are meaningful. We've seen actually union contracts, for example, um, in Poland with Amazon already, where they have banned surveillance technologies and wearables. It's not that it isn't possible, it's not. It's that we feel that it isn't possible. Um, so two things in, in the US context, in addition to you know, broader, the broader growth of, of labor policy, um, you know, overturning Taft-Hartley, all these sort of utopian things that I will will fight till, to the death for. Um, I'm also thinking about, um, you know, and, and Michael Pure really articulated the difficulties of this given the extraordinary, I, I talk about it uh, in terms of not compartmentalization, but laws mystification around employment status, um, and that there are so many different agencies that determine employment status under so many different um, tests, it becomes very complicated. The standardization of an employment test on a federal level, which is something that David Weil um, had stood behind and was part of the reason that he, he was not um, he was not confirmed by um, by the Congress to be the the wage and hour administrator. Um, but in addition to employment more broadly, I want to and I have an emerging paper called Data Abolition for Fair Work to think about. And this really speaks to what I talked to at the very end of my comments to think about how it is not okay that we just collect data uh, or that employers just collect data willy-nilly. Um, we've seen precedent at the FTC recently in a settlement with Weight Watchers. Um, we've seen the FTC demand algorithmic destruction, um, dis a demand that Weight Watchers destroy any AI models that were built on the data of um, young children whose parents did not consent to the production of that data and to the gathering of that data. So I think that we already have existing legal tools to demand and that certain forms of data and certain forms of surveillance via digital technologies are, are just not allowed in workplaces, including location data, um, including 
um, the collection of data around finan finances of workers, um, including um, data around around productivity levels. And I mean specifically digital, um, digital, uh, digital, digital data, not just sort of watching someone um, around productivity. And again, we've seen it in in um, in, con in contracts and actual contracts with these behemoth tech companies in in Europe in at least two or three different contexts that I'm aware of. Um, and I'd like to see. So in California, we recently passed a bill um, to get Amazon to sort of you know, Amazon injury rates in warehouses are so high. So to because of the wearables and because of the surveillance. And so one of the things that um, uh, Assemblywoman Lorena Gonzalez, now head of the California Labor Federation, did was pass a law that said, okay, Amazon, you have to make sure that workers are getting breaks. You have to make sure that your productivity levels do not actually um, violate health and safety concerns of workers. Another way to get at that same issue, though, is to say no wearables no data collection around these issues. Um, and so I, I, you know, in my, some of these things that I'm saying, you know, disconnecting Im immigration from thinking about labor, et cetera, might sound really utopian, but I think it's important that we as academics and researchers sort of push our thinking in that direction um, so that we can sort of shift our imaginaries and our imaginations in relationship to technology and work. So I think we do we Oh, okay. Go ahead. So hi, I'm Shivali. I'm an AI system scientist. So my question is going to push on a different angle of policy. Right. So I'm wondering what the panel thinks of new regulations that are designed to constrain the kinds of reasoning AI systems are doing. So right, for example, in Vina's case, this would be constraints over dynamic pricing. Right, how can algorithms decide between what is the right price? Or in case of YouTube recommendation engines, and that's an example Krugman brought up yesterday, which is also you know, one of the reasons why there's a lot of inequity in just YouTube uh, uh, content producers. How do we make those recommendations? Right? What is it that the engine is optimizing for? Is it optimizing for clicks or views or diversity of content? Right. So, do you see that policy has a role in algorithmic decision making, and how do we come up with the right policy to con to constrain and control that part? What I'm going, where I'm going with um, with this with this paper in this particular context. Um, um, I think that we come up with those policies by having the AI system scientists talking to um, regulators who are talking to workers together about how they're experiencing this work and um, and identifying problems that way and putting um, putting guard rules in 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 um, in place in that way. The and maybe you know this, but the YouTube um, YouTubers Union um, in Germany has put forth a number of of desires for regulatory structures. Uh, not just around transparency, but actually around control that they'd like the German government to implement to make it easier for them to have some semblance over their livelihoods, you know, as opposed to just waking up one morning and wondering why they don't get it, they're not getting any views. Um, so I don't know, I feel like there's a lot of really interesting work being done in this area, a lot of interesting ideas. Um, I think there just needs to be a willingness to to make this real, to be able to say, and precisely what you so beautifully articulated, that it is possible, and this is the point of everyone's commentary, it is possible to regulate technology, to regulate AI systems, to say at some point, no, this is not where we're going with this, this production of, of modeling. So I think we can uh, relate everything that's been discussed to Paul Krugman's talk from last night in the sense that he uh, he had a, a very nice sort of summary of the idea of sort of technological utopianism that we, you know, that technological advances would in fact democratize work among and, and consumption as well. Um, and it's clear from all of these talks that that really hasn't happened. And, and one of the reasons uh, is, I think, from these talks, we can see that um, the the people and the institutions that are imposing these technological uh, systems have an agenda that you know is fairly fair to say roughly capitalist right and they they do want to extract profit from these systems 
and we know, of course, uh, given what Bob's been saying, that, that, that the profits are going upwards for the most part. So, so this is an important thing. I, I think uh, the idea of worker uh, initiated, you know, worker cooperatives and, and consumer cooperatives uh, using technology, I think that's going to be one of the major things going on in the future, um, which may change this a bit. But so I just wanted to relate what everyone said back to Paul Krugman's talk from from last night, um, and then I think on that note, I think we really have to call it a, a, an evening. Um, so I just wanted to, to. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, daytime for some of us, evening for some others. But um, uh, you know, I think it was just a wonderful series of talks, and uh, and it's just and they all sort of you know, relate to one another in wonderful ways. So thank you for everyone, including Bob in Chicago. Um, and uh, we've had a great session here. Um, so uh, I think everyone can go home uh, feeling enlightened. So thank you very much. <laughs>